watching games with my dad. Your dad take you to a lot of games? No. Mostly we'd watch him on TV. He'd run an extension cord out to the porch, put on our Yankee caps, crack open a beer. Way to go, Dad. Well, root beer for me. <laughs> During commercials, we'd throw the ball around. Sounds like something to go home for. It is. And when I go back, we still do it. Except now I drink real beer. Hmm. Oh, man. When I'd pay to have that bat in my collection. That's a lot of money for that piece of wood. Piece of wood? Yeah. I mean, take away the fact that DiMaggio was morning, it's just a bat. Put some guy named Pollock in splatter paint on a canvas and you think it's worth millions of dollars. Splatter paint on a canvas. You stand in front of one of Pollock's works. The chaos fades away and you see the discipline. The balance of restraints and abandon. Like when DiMaggio stepped up to the plate. Great art has a broader meaning. It captures a time, a place, an emotion. This bat was used to set the all-time hit streak record the same year Hirohito bombed Pearl Harbor. For four, five at-bats a day, Jolt and Joel let Americans forget that we were going to war. Time, a place, and emotion. This bat, those balls, these pennants got this country through some tough times. We still do. Gives us something to root for. And if you work hard, swing for the fences, But, Richard Nixon, I love my crack pipes and my beer bongs. Man, Richard Nixon is such a buzz buzzkill. <laughs> Alright, hello everyone. I need to check my mic volume. I fear that it's down and I'll end up yelling at you guys again. It seems to be a common thread. Ooh, no, it's actually way high. We are. There we go. Watching. That's more better. -er. Now I can talk normally. And it doesn't peak for you guys quite so much.
Ah, so good times. Welcome to Saturday. I keep thinking it's Friday because I didn't stay at work on Thursday. I ended up coming home sick. So now it's Friday, it's Saturday, and I keep thinking it's Friday. So I have to remember I have a donation today. Today's my fifty-dollar day. I'll be back over three hundred dollars again. Isn't that nice? It won't stay that way though. It never does. I get three hundred dollars, and I'm like, spend it, spend it now, spend it. Quickly, quickly, spin it as quick as you can. Go on, do it now. Today is a uh, flavorful pur purchase. I've been looking at an Elgato. That was the green screen I was talking about before. It's an Elgato green screen. I mean, it's portable, but it comes in a tube. Well, it comes in a square case. It's a case, not really a box. It's a case. And you know how the old in the olden days... Okay, ba <laughs> basically this is what they did. You know how back in the day, if you're older than, say, 25, before they had digital TVs, you know, before they had, t the only TV they had were the ones that came in on the cars, the big CRT TVs with the VCR, or maybe had a laser disc on it that they never used because laser discs were expensive, but they bought the players anyway, because why the hell not, hooray? And they'd wheel that sucker in, and they'd shift it around and try to get it to where everyone could see it, and then they put a, a VHS tape in, and then later on when I was about to graduate, maybe a DVD. Most commonly still a VHS. <laughs> uh, school budgets. Anyway, you know, they had, back in the day when they had those, right? And they didn't have, like, they didn't have this, every room didn't have a TV on the wall. Well, back then, when a teacher wanted to show you something, they had to put it on slides. And they had to put the slides on that overhead projector, right? You guys remember those? You put the overhead projector with the big clear plastic thing and you scribbled on the plastic thing. Or some teachers would write right on the glass, which then, um dry out the ink in like a second and then they'd have to try, try to clean it off and that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> they had to replace the glass. Anyway, nostalgia time. Anyway, point being is remember how when they put up the projector, you had to, you had to, they had to reach up and grab that hook that was above, that would always hang. It was on a string. It was on a string and it was above the, the, the chalkboard. Yes, I went to classes that had chalkboards and I went to classes that had whiteboards, so I'm old. <laughs> But above the whiteboard, it would always hang there and get in the way. And everyone's like, what the hell is that for? Because they never took it down, because schools don't throw anything away, but you never use it. You grab that ring and you yank it down. It's this big vinyl white screen. They turn off the lights, flip on the thing, and it would project, right? Or if the teacher got super lazy, they'd flip on the projector and it would just project against the whiteboard and have all those bumps in it. <laughs> anyway, so that big, you know, that you pull it down and you have this big vinyl white screen. Well, basically what Elgato has done is they've taken that particular device off the wall, flipped we it over, put it on the ground, and what you can do is you pop it you. open and you lift up on it and out pops this green screen. And so it's a portable green screen for Twitch streamers. It's genius, absolute mind-boggling genius that they've taken this thing that was in all of our classrooms, flipped it over, spray-painted it green, and suddenly, bam! New, uh, <laughs> new product for 150 bucks. But the laser display was given away with a TV by the store because it had way too many. <laughs> yeah. So, um... Hmm? Yeah, I have no idea what that number is. I write down weird, weird things in video games. Anyway. Point being. Um... <laughs> sorry, I was looking at some... Um... So yeah, Elgato created a green screen that you just basically slide behind you and then lift and open. And I was thinking about getting one, and if I got one, I could do, you know, Fache we Cam for you guys, if you're interested. Watching you. From the sounds of it, though, no one's interested. I mentioned it, and Spoon is all like, no, you need better lighting. And I'm like, well, I was going to get lighting. He's like, no. <laughs> so, so I don't think you guys, I think you guys secretly don't like my face. I think you guys think that I might be ugly. That kind of makes me sad inside. But it's not surprising because I looked at myself in my webcam today and I was like, damn, am I ugly. So I can kind of understand where you're coming from. Ah, pardon me, I'm just crushing a... Wait for it. Yeah. Want to hear another one? Yeah. <laughs> do it for, do it for, jinx, do it for, do it for, jinx, do it for, do it for, no neck. <laughs> Uh, no next deal for Jinx Stoden Tooth. Hmm. I wouldn't mind being that voice actor. 
Dilfe, Dilfe, no neck to Dilfe. Till the end of time. <laughs> Till the end of time. Speaking of Dilfa no neck Doden tooth, I need to get my hands on, um, I need to design my third email for you guys, because I have not at all ever. We want your face, just not with Shiz Green Screen. <laughs> well, I don't like, I don't, I don't like having, I don't, I don't like green, I don't like face cams that take up a huge chunk of screen. I like alpha blending. I like, you know, being able to see through stuff. If there's we no reason to have all that background crap, why have all that background crap, right? So, you know, I figure I could have a green screen. Yeah. Shut up and take my money. Cup a spoon with imperial bits. Ah! Well, thank you, Mr. Wells. I'm sure that won't make spoon cry or anything. Lol. Anyway, so today. We're doing Tales from the Dark, and once again, um, we are doing half a stream today, and the reason why is because I'm donating. Today, again, is my $50 day. Hooray! Seven has been telling me there's a, a dude there at her work. He's from another center. He's there to observe. And he keeps telling them they're all screw-ups and could do better if they just stop screwing up so bad. Uh, I'd, you know, be all over that, except for the fact that... Um, He's not going to be there today, which is now their, like, psychotic busy day. Like, psychotic busy day. And he's just like, you guys could be doing so much better. You have enough people. You're fine. You're not overwhelmed. And it's like, be here on Saturday, you do. She's like, no, I'm leaving on Friday. Like, then you're a jerk and you don't actually care. <laughs> but that's how things roll. Anyway. Um. So I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm just kind of chilling. So yeah, we're doing, um. Tales from the Dark today for you guys, so that'll be fun. Go without proper lighting, we won't be able to see through it. It will be all film flimmery and stuff. Flimmery. Hey, I did an okay green screen with. I just did. You know what my green screen was for like the Halloween streams and stuff? A green sheet pinned to my ceiling with thumbtacks and push pins. I mostly push pins. I don't use thumbtacks. But yeah, it was it was a sheet. It's a green sheet pinned to my ceiling with push pins. I think an actual chroma keyed green screen would be a pretty big step up. <laughs> and I could get proper lighting. I mean, I stream during the morning. I could just open up my window. I could, I could literally just like push the curtain aside and bam, green screen, perfect lighting. Probably wouldn't light my face very well, but screen, green screen, perfect lighting. And I could get one of those round makeup mirrors. You know, the makeup mirrors with the little, the soft light in it? I just aim that at my, at my grill. Bam, baby. I would be pretty. People would want to do me. Oh yes, they would want to do me. <laughs> Which is all flimmery around your face. <laughs> well, I tried my best. I don't, you know, at the time I didn't have any better options. Besides, I don't know if a face cam would help me. As a matter of fact, there's a chance that if people saw my face and my screen, Watching run, you. not ever come back, unfollow. You know? People will pull their Patreon support and be like, My God, man, I didn't realize how ugly that was. Blah. Uh, Seven was supposed to send me a thing today, and now I'm sad. Only if you showed a bit of cleavage, maybe? I could do that. I could, dude, I could push, yeah, push them together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll wear one of Seven's bras on my head. I'll show forehead cleavage. Hey, Zagathy, welcome! So I'm gonna try to be a little bit more calm today for you guys. I have to remember, I, I've been utilizing the community section of Twitch. I don't know if it helps at all. I mean, at one point I did get told I was in the wrong community, so I know that somebody's paying attention. <laughs> I don't know who, though. But I'm in a community for relaxed streaming, because I figure, you know, a creative stream where you read, that's pretty relaxing, right? Well, the only rule in this particular relaxed streaming section is literally no yelling. That's it, no yelling. Of course, they say it with all caps, so I think it's counterintuitive to the, to the ruling itself. But anyway, point being that it says no yelling, so I have to be calm-ish. Oh, on the plus side, I, um, I uh, threw some WD-40 on my, on my chair there. So it doesn't squeak quite as much. It still squeaks. You can kind of hear it there. 
Maybe a little bit. Anyway, but not as much as it once did. I would never pull my Patreon support because of your cam. I want to see KB cam. Yay! <laughs> Buy a box of Apple's KB. That's sure to get someone's attention. Well, no, I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, one of her co-workers' dad died recently. He passed away. And, um... He has a GoFundMe in order to, you know, beef up his ability to, to bury said father and pay for medical bills that were accru accrued and other things. And Seven asked if I could very kindly print it out for her, but she sent it... I don't know why she sent it where she sent it, but she sent it to an ancient Facebook that I had a thousand years ago. Rather than to my 4KB short Facebook, or more appropriately, a Twitch message, or a Discord message, or a, well, not a Patreon message, or even, even a text, anything. She could have sent it to me a thousand different ways, and she sent it to me the one way I couldn't get access to it. So I sent her a text, and I'm like, I don't have it, you gotta send it to me some other way. But I was gonna post it for you guys to see... You know, if you feel like helping, I know it's not an Im it, okay. it's important to some people. So what I'm about to say is going to sound rude, but I know it doesn't seem like an important thing because it's a coworker of Seven's dad passed away, and it's a GoFundMe for him, and that's about as far removed from you guys as you could possibly get if we didn't live on Mars. So it's more of a hey, if you could get the word out there, maybe someone would notice it, and he would get the funds he needs, kind of thing. You know, it's my good deed for the day kind of deal. I understand God or Buddha or somebody's really into that kind of crap. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually get to watch, but only because I have the flu. Hey, fat dog, welcome. I'm sorry that you have the flu, but I'm glad that you are here. I hope you, um... Well, I hope you get to enjoy. We're reading today, so there's not going to be much to watch. It's mostly going to be listening, and we only have half a stream today. I donate it, uh, I have to go donate it too, so I end at one on uh, on this day, and I probably shouldn't be wasting so much time talking, I should probably be actually reading at this point. <laughs> New KB goal, donate X amount of money bullets for face being turned off. Aww. Mm, bra on head, what's next? Hooking up a Barbie doll, <laughs> hooking a Barbie doll up to your computer and letting a lightning strike? Well, sure, I mean, it might be weird, but it's still science. No yelling, KB, you are in the wrong community. <laughs> well, that's why I said I'm trying, Spoon. I'm trying. I am trying not to yell. I adjusted my microphone so I, I won't yell. I'm being very calm today so I don't yell. Leaning back in my chair. Ooh, such a lovely guy. I know, right, Heko? I'm sexy. People want to touch me. Stop giving me your hats. Oh. Uh, only half a stream. Let's talk some more before it starts. <laughs> yeah, let's talk some more before it starts. Well, we are going to start. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys know that today's music is brought to you by the internet. <laughs> it's brought to you by YouTube. I decided to listen to something a little bit calming today, so here's some internet for you. There you go. Have some internet. That's that's what we've been listening to for the last 10 minutes. Now I'm going to switch over to game. Game. Please no crotch cam. Okay, no crotch cam. I'm fine. Crotch cam is fine. Okay, now Tales from the Dark. TFTD is what I call it. Because that is how I do. Q R S T F T. You know, it's probably not you know, every time. Every time. I don't even know if it's on there. Whatever. Let's just open it and see if it pops up. TFT. Fantastic. Yeah, see, I knew it. Oop, music's still on. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. Here we are. There, right there, perfect. Perfect. Shh, no yelling. It's like a library. I'd be very quiet. Shh, shut up. <laughs> the chill YouTube music? Yeah, chill YouTube music. I've been listening to a lot of that. I usually listen to New Retro Wave. I listen to a lot of New Retro Wave. Um, but. I've been finding the music that we have is repetitive right now, and it kept locking up the other day, and it was really starting to irritate, so I figured a little bit of YouTube is fine. Do I need to deploy smooth jazz? <laughs> Deploying smooth jazz in three, two, one. Can we need some smooth jazz to be more relaxed? I actually was listening to jazz earlier this morning. It's okay. You know, it's good. It's not what I'm in the mood for, though. I mean, I get in the mood for music. Last night, I listened to... 
You guys ever watch if you if you live if you were alive in the eighties, back before the Chipmunks three D movie, there was a Chipmunks movie from the eighties called um well the Chipmunks movie I think I don't even remember what the title was. But there's a song in it called The Boys of Rock and Roll, and I actually popped that up and listened to it last night because it had popped into my head, and I'm like, I gotta listen to that song, so I listened to it last night. Um, this morning, I put up, I put in the, the theme song for A Boy Named Charlie Brown, because I love Charlie Brown, and so um, I listened to A Boy Named Charlie Brown this morning for a little pick-me-up. I listened to just, like, one-off little songs here and there. I mainly blocked out things that happened in the 80s. Oh. Well, see, that's what co too much cocaine will do to you. <laughs> uh, the Chipmunk Adventure, yeah. Um, that was a good song. It was an okay film. It was a good song. Anyway, so, we are on chapter 23. Now, if you guys don't remember... Oh, I need, I need my title. One second. We're going to spin around. Woo! Um, it's still spinning. Spinning, 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 spinning. Where is my doohickey? Book tittle. There it is. Frederick pulls the world. The end of time. Alright, there you go. Alright, so, um, if you guys remember where we were, or if you don't remember where we were, we. <laughs> what? Too much cocaine. It also affects the hearing. <laughs> Sorry. I don't give any crap, Mr. Wells. So, we were on chapter 23. Now, if you remember. Victor had been frozen. He's been frozen a total of four times now. I think he's like in his 80s. Like actual 80s. Like Earth 80s. I mean, he's old. He's old. He's getting like liver spots on his hands and stuff. He's old. But he's banging the crap out of this big-eyed chick. You know, big-eyed alien human. She's human. She's pure human. No alien inbreeding. But because she's lived on the space station with light gravity, she's got really long limbs and really big eyeballs. Um, and really wispy hair. So he's... Basically banging Mr. Burns in that episode when he gets high all the time. <laughs> That's what he's having sex with. Um, as a matter of fact, after reading this last week, I came across... I was on Twitter, and you know how everybody has that thing on, on their phone where they take pictures of themselves and then they can add crap to it? I don't know what the hell. And then they make their eyes really big like anime eyes? That's what you're looking at. I mean, those, if those pictures creep you out, that is what Victor is currently sleeping with. Hmm? Hmm? We are... Anyway, Watching so in, in the classic Victor fashion, he is trying to crowbar stuff into people's minds that they don't care about. They're like, let's just have sex and, and build genomes and be happy and alive and, and be glad the sun is burning again and and not, you know, the planets aren't wasting away and we're, we're here and alive and there's millions of us instead of thousands of us again. We're humans and we're alive and the rest of the universe is dead and here we are. And instead, Victor's like, no, 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 the universe was there, it was bright, I got frozen because I wouldn't give up on it, now it's gone, and I, I, murder me if you have to, but I have to learn about why the universe isn't there, because I'm a moron. And uh, so he's going to a birthday party, I guess, to figure that out. <laughs> I bring you peace, break his legs! Exactly. <laughs> he brings peace, break his legs. Um, so... You know, that that's what Victor's doing. Now, Juan 2, if you remember, the, you know, with Victor's star cluster moving at near the speed of light, the rest of the universe has basically aged and died. It has gone to the, the it has gone to entropy. Um, so, Juan 2 is currently living in the dead chunk of a star absorbing protons as a, as a split. That's how he's, that's how he's staying alive. Basically, he's licking dewdrops off of a dead leaf. <laughs> That's how this is going for him. So the universe is dead for him, and he doesn't know what to do with him, so he doesn't want to die, but he has no energy and no power. Um... And so that's that's the two sides of the story. So we're going to continue with chapter 23, where Victor is going... Actually... Uh... Actually, the chapter 23 is going to start with Juan 2 this time, rather than Victor, so we're going to learn about Juan 2 today. That entropy, I know, right? <laughs> Reminiscing is a recre recreation for the elderly. That is what people do when they have outlived all their uh, other occupations. People like one too. Elderly human beings at least have bodily functions to use up some hours. They have to eat, use the toilet, maybe even hoist themselves into their wheelchairs and complain to those around them. One two didn't have even those ways of passing the time. One two didn't just have very little else to do. He had nothing else to do. 
In the exhausted, depleted, moribund universe that Wantu lived in, he not only didn't need to do anything to keep on living, he had nothing much in the way of limbs, powers, or effectors to do anything with. His mind was still worked. Excuse me, his mind still worked. Quite clearly, in fact, although at a depressingly slow speed. But everything stayed within his mind. He didn't have any useful appendages anymore to convert any of his mind's impulses into action. All that being so, Wantu was lucky he had so much to rem reminisce about. He certainly did have a lot of memories. If there had been a contest to see which single being among all the universe's inhabitants and all the endless eons of its existence had the most in the way of stored up memories to take out and chew over, Wantu would have been the incontestable winner. If your mind remains clear, and Wantu's had, you can remember a lot out of a lifetime of 10 to the 40th years. 10 to the 40th power years. And maybe much more still to come. That was one of the things Wantu had to think about for there still was at least one decision he sooner or later would have to make. That was going to be a very hard decision, because it was so very hard he preferred not to think about it. There was, after all, positively no hurry at all. But Wantu liked to think about, the only thing that could be described as a pleasure that he still had left, was the days when he had had all the power any being could ever have desired. Ah, those long-gone days... Days when he carelessly deployed the energies of stars on the whim of a moment, without a care for the future, without penalty for his spendthrift ways. When he cruised at will from star to star, from galaxy to galaxy, wistfully he remembered how wonderful it was to enter a virgin galaxy, bright with billions upon billions of unoccupied stars, and all his. When he lived off copies of himself for companions, for companionship, and battled joyfully against them for survival when they turned against him. Even the frights and worries of those days were tenderly recalled now. Wantu remembered lolling on the surface of a star, taking his ease in the cool luxury of its six or seven thousand degrees, and he thought, that cool. And swimming through the star's unimaginably dense core, and frolicking in the corona, temperature now up to a couple million degrees, soaked with x-rays, dashing out as far as ten million miles from the star's surface to the corona's fringe, and then happily plunging back. He remembered the fun and challenges, oh, he relished remembering the challenges, when he had created those little copies of himself, High Tick and Rom and Poor Silly One 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 and Kind and Happy and all the others he had made. He even remembered, though not very well, the terribly stupid matter copies he had made, like Five. He didn't actually remember Five as an individual, to be sure. Five had not been important to him just then. What he remembered was living. And though it gave him a sort of melancholy joy to remember, the knowledge that he would never have such times again made him almost despair. It was only when he was close to despair that he could force himself to think about the other thing, the one about which he would sooner or later have to make a decision. It concerned the only things in the universe that had ever really frightened Wantu, because there was so much about them that even he had never been able to understand. Black holes. Dun dun dun. There lay the choice that ultimately Wan Tu would have to make. Not right away, to be sure. Nothing ever had to be right away in this dreary eternity, but sooner or later, for the sake of survival. A black hole might very well give him his best chance for really long-term survival. Wan Tu wasn't sure he quite wanted to survive on those terms. He did not care for black holes. The locked-in singularities where a star once had been and then collapsed upon itself and pulled space in around it, were about the only sorts of objects in the universe one two had never investigated in person. He hoped he would never have to. They were scary. The frightening thing about black holes was that inside them the laws of the universe, the laws that one two understood so well, did not apply, because black holes were no longer really part of the universe. They had seeded from it. It was easy enough to get inside a black hole. In fact, the problem sometimes was to avoid falling into one. Once or twice, one two had to exert himself to steer away from one's neighborhood. But, but, getting in was a purely one-way trip. Once inside, you couldn't get out again. Even light was stuck there. That wasn't because the immense gravitational field of the black hole pulled light back down to its surface, as, say, the gravity of a planet like Earth pulls a thrown ball back down. Lantu knew better than that. Lantu was quite, sh quite aware that light can't slow down. That's why C is invariant. The reason even light couldn't escape was simply because the gravity of the black hole wrapped space around it, bent it so that the light orbited around it eternally, within the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole, as planets orbit around a sun. 
But the exact mechanism that caught and held anything that wandered by in those cosmic traps wasn't really what mattered to Wantu. What mattered was that once you were inside, you couldn't get out again, ever. Not light, not matter. Not even Wantu himself. But things were terrifying. Nevertheless, they had their virtues, Wantu told himself. One of those virtues was that a good-sized black hole, say even one as little as three or four solar masses, would continue its existence for a long time. That was not just a very long time. Like Wantu's present age of 10 to the 40th years, it was a long, long time. 10 to the 66th years, anyway. Those are numbers a few human beings can ever grasp. Even Wantu had trouble working with them. Ordinary arithmetic isn't meant for such numbers. But what they meant was that if one two were to take the plunge so that he could live as long as one of those fair-sized black holes, which is to say four, and there's one with a crap ton of zeros after it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I can say that number. <laughs> it literally has two lines of zeros. And if you subtract from that his present lifetime, which was to say the present age of the universe, because by now they were pretty much the same number, which amounted to ten with a lot of zeros after it, if then he succeeded in living as long as a black hole continued to radiate energy, he had still to look forward to another... Okay, there's about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8... 9 groups of 9 with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 groups of zeros. So, you know, a really, 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 really long time. <laughs> Years of existence. If such numbers meant anything at all, even to one too. And if, of course, you could call that existence. Because that radiated energy from the black hole wasn't really very energetic at all. Such a black hole didn't begin to radiate in the first place until the mean temperature of the universe, what was called the background radiation, when human beings first discovered it in their silly little microwave dishes back in the 20th century, had dropped to the very low value of one ten millionth of one degree above absolute zero. It was only at that temperature that the black hole would begin to radiate. It was a very feeble warmth indeed. Wantu knew dismally that he could manage to survive, more or less, even with the sort of input, but he did not like the idea at all. The only thing was that he didn't see any better alternative. Until he became aware that the tiny tick his few remaining sensors had registered some time earlier was, strangely enough, a sudden and wholly unidentified flux of tachyons. You've been discovered. <laughs> uh, chapter 24. Okay, now we're back on Victor and his birthday party. Norina was flushed and excited as they boarded the bus. It's going to be a very nice party, she was saying. She seemed younger than Victor had ever seen her, happily making sure her packages were stored and that Victor got a window seat. Have you got the cat? Please, don't let go of it. We'll have a couple of velocity changes and we don't want it flying around and hitting some of the passengers in the face. You don't get space sick, do you? Victor Sorokane, who was fairly sure he was the oldest living space pilot in the known universe, didn't dignify that with an answer. How far are we going? he asked as he settled himself into the soft webbing of the seat, carefully adjusting the belt so it didn't squeeze the, the restless little kitten on his lap. The dark-haired man across the aisle was staring at the little animal. Not far. Fritz's family lives on a fabrication habitat. They make things. It's two or three levels down, but it's less than a quarter orbit away. It'll take about two hours to get there. The cabin needs a few cats. You know, if I could find an animated cat, I could, like, put one in there for you. What we need is an animated Shia LaBeouf. Stand in the corner and freak us out. <laughs> hey guys, do you get space sick? I would think. <laughs> two hours. A space life of only two hours. But he had picked up on something else she had said. Is it a family party? I'm not family, he objected. She looked at him in surprise. That doesn't matter. I am, sort of, anyway. They'd certainly be glad to have you. There are always guests at this kind of party. She stopped to, to nod to a young-looking woman who was strolling languidly through the, the bus, glancing to see that everyone was strapped in. That's the driver, Nerina informed him as the woman passed. We'll be leaving in a moment now. The driver seated herself in the front of the bus before a broad screen. Casually, she pulled a board of pale lights and twinkling colors down into her lap, glancing over at it, over it for a moment. Then she touched the control that closed the entrance hatch behind them, and Nerina said, Here we go, Victor. Don't let go of the cat. <laughs> Put the cat in a kennel. Jesus. <laughs> then they were in space. In space! Victor was thrilled by the feel of the bus launching itself free of the habitat. It wasn't violent. 
The launch was no more than a gentle thrust against the back of the webbing, a quarter gravity at most. Victor found himself grinning in pleasure, though he felt Nerina beside him shifting uncomfortably in her seat. Absently, Victor patted her knee with his free hand. Under his other hand, the kitten didn't seem to mind the acceleration at all. It was actually purring. Considered as a spaceship, the bus was... a bus. Even the old new manhole lander shuttles had been twice its size, but then they necessarily had to be. They had to carry the fuel and the rockets capable of fighting a planet's gravity. The bus had no such needs. All it needed were air and room for a dozen or so passengers, and engines enough to push it along through inter-orbital inter space. Just outside Victor's window, it seemed, was, smol was the smoldering and bloody face of the brown dwarf Nergal. The planet was less than a hundred thousand miles below them, almost hurting his eyes until Narita indulgently leaned over him and darkened the polarization. Nergal light wasn't the bright sunshine, it looked hot through... <laughs> Nergal light wasn't like bright sunshine, it looked hot, though only visible light came through the polarization with the infrared frequency screened out. The word for it was baleful. Have you ever bailed the sun before? Sorry guys, I keep hearing this clicking, popping sound. I think it's my computer, but it sounds like metal rubbing against metal, which means if it is my computer, bad things are afoot. <laughs> hmm? I think the fireplace needs some fireplace related things, like one of those picks and maybe a bit of wood piled up next to it. Well, this is all free stuff I found on the asset store. So if you guys can find some pre, uh, like some free crap on the asset store, I can throw in here that you think might be useful. Let me know, because that's all this stuff is—just free crap from the asset store. <laughs> this is a fireplace that does not go down. Nope, it burns forever. It's got a little two-dimensional flame in it. I built that flame all by myself using a tutorial. I'm very proud of me. <laughs> I have made fire. <laughs> Where was I? Right, baleful. As the ship rotated, Nergal slid away, and Victor got a look at the habitat they had just left. A length of sewer pipe, half a mile long, spinning in a stately slow motion, with odds and ends of junk hanging from it. Some of the appendages were the great mirrors that caught Nergal's hot radiation and funneled it into the mega... Oh god. Magna to hydrodynamic generators that gave them the power they needed to run the habitat. Some were probably communications gear. More were things Victor could not even guess at. Then that was gone, too, and Victor turned to find Nerina looking at him with interest. You're excited, aren't you? she asked, placing her hand over his. I guess I am, he admitted. Oh, Nerina, it's so good to be in space again. That's what I dreamed about when I was a boy. Look, there's another ship, he cried as something the size of a family car slid rapidly past, only a mile or two away. Nerina glanced briefly at the thing. It's just a cargo drone, probably nobody in it. Then reassuringly she said, This is quite safe, you know, Victor. But it wasn't safety that was on his mind. It was a gl glandular excitement of being in space. Victor stared longingly at the nearly empty black sky. It was so terribly black, so very little was left of the familiar sky. Without Nergal and the dis or the distant sun, there was nothing to see but an occasional glint, a distant habitat, perhaps, or another ship, and one or two more distant things, the surviving stars. That was it. The familiar spread of constellations that had always been there, always, simply did not exist anymore. Victor shivered. He had never felt so alone. Great, you're the, you're the only human in the universe and you feel alone. Wait, I can't look at the thing. <laughs> this is going to spin us when I click on on, your, on the link here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> exactly, I have made fire. <laughs> That's what I did, I made fire. <clears throat> hmm, excuse me. <laughs> yes, exactly that. <laughs> uh, wait, are there any fireplaces in Fallout 4? There aren't in the, in the settlement build menus, at least. Actually, no, I don't think there are any fireplaces in Fallout 4. I don't know if there are any in Fallout 3, either, actually. There may have been? Actually, for the American version, you spelled the word ember right. I don't know if embers are spelled differently in Germany. Bernie Ash leftover stuff firewood crap. <laughs> Hmm. Chatter beside him reminded him that he wasn't alone at all. Narina had taken the kitten from him and was feeding it with a little object like a baby bottle, while half a dozen other passengers were clustered around in admiration, braced awkwardly against the mild thrust of the ship. Yes, it is called a cat, Narina was explaining. No, they've been extinct for ages. Yes, it's the only one of its kind now. I just finished it. But if it lives, I think I'll make a mate for it. No, they aren't wild animals. People used to have them in their houses all the time. Didn't they, Victor? She appealed. But 
Oh, yes, they make great pets, Victor confirmed, recalled <laughs> to reality. They do have claws, though, and they needed to be housebroken. That led to more questions. What are, were claws? What was housebroken? Could they be trained to do useful things, like gillies? Until the driver broke up the party. Everyone get back to his seat, please, she called. We'll be matching orbits with the target in a moment. As the little ship swerved, Victor saw what was waiting for them. The new habitat was also cylindrical, no doubt because that was the best shape for an orbiting people container. But along its perimeter were a dozen rosettes of air hatches where odd-looking little ships had attached themselves. They're raw material gatherers, Narina explained he, when he asked. This is a manufacturing habitat, didn't I tell you? That's what Fritz family does, manufacturing. Those things, I suppose you've never seen them before, they're set loose here. They go out to the asteroids and so on to grow and reproduce themselves and bring back metals and things to use. Victor felt a start of recognition. Like von Neumann machines, he asked, remembering the ore collecting nautiloids that, had been, that he had encountered so often in the seas of New Manhome. I don't know what those are, but... Oh, look, that must be Pelly's ship. And Victor forgot the von Neumanns, because as the habitat rotated under them, he saw that Narina was pointing to. Yes, that was a ship, a real spaceship, hugged to the shell of the habitat. The ship had to be nearly a thousand feet long by itself, and it had turned at the... And it... I cannot speak. <laughs> And in and it in turn had hugged to its own shell a lander larger than their bus. He stared at it longingly. That was more like it. A man could take pride in piloting a ship like that. Maybe Pelly will be at the party, Raina said with a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, but it's the vessel in the pestle. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> anyway, we'll be getting out. <laughs> Damn it. Sorry, I got the giggles. <laughs> Damn it, Danny K, why are you so funny? <laughs> Give me a minute, I got the giggles. Embers in the, is the small glowy bits left over from a fire. Amber is the tree sap the Jurassic Park finds insects in. Amber is also the girl I had my fingers in. Never mind, I made that up. <laughs> no mention it for you because you lied. It was Simone. <laughs> well, it might have been someone else. Ah! They found a baby bird in Amber. Which is kind of sad because that means either the bird was dead and then the, then the amber hit it, or while the mother was away, the baby bird was then covered by amber because it couldn't fly. Either way, that totally sucks. But they did find a tiny baby bird trapped in amber. The story is getting dark. <laughs> well, that's because the fire keeps going out because Mike keeps taking all of our embers. <laughs> anyway, back to the story. Anyway, we'll be getting out in a minute, Victor. Do you want to take the cat? She passed the kitten to him, and then leaning past him, looked with disfavor at the habitat. It doesn't look like much, does it? It's so big. It has to be, I suppose, because they do all sorts of industrial things there. I don't think anyone would live there if they didn't have to. Still, it's quite nice on the inside, anyway. You'll see. What she said was true. On the inside, the factory habitat was nice. Very much so. But it took Victor a while to find that out. Its design was not like the one they had come from. It was almost a reversal of Narina's, in fact. Instead of a shell of dwelling places surrounding a core of machinery, the habitat's machinery was all in the outer shell. The passengers exited the bus into a noisy, steel-walled cavern, with the thumping, grinding sounds of distant industrial production coming from somewhere not far or far on the other side of the wall. Then Victor and Rena and the kitten took a fast little elevator, and when they emerged, Victor saw that the whole heart of the cylinder was a vast open space. Great trees grew along the inside of the rim, all queerly straining up towards the axis of the cylinder. There's a glowing rod-like thing stretched. Excuse me. There, there, not theirs. <laughs> there, a glowing rod-like thing stretched from end to end, and it gave them light. The whole place was almost like a vast park rolled round to join itself. It was a teetering, vertiginous place to be, for the ground beneath Victor's feet curved up past the glowing central rod to become the sky over his head. Nothing fell on him, of course. Victor knew perfectly well that nothing could, because the rotation of the habitat passed those distant upside-down trees and people as firmly to their pasted <laughs> those distant upside-down trees, and people as firmly to their ground as he was pasted to his. You know, it would make a really great game of baseball if you could figure out a way to fling one from one side of that place to the other. Though, what would happen when you hit the sun? <laughs> <laughs> 
All the same, he was less uneasy when he avoided looking up. Yeah, be like me, Victor. Don't ever look up. There were plenty of other things to see. There were brooks and ponds. There were beds of flowering plants and farm patches. There were even herds of what looked like sheep and cattle grazing on the meadows that bent up to join on the far side of the habitat. There were people, too. Many people. Going about their business or simply strolling and enjoying their park. Um, I have to write down a couple of things, guys. Sorry. I'm an owl exterminator. <laughs> Sorry, I got out of my car last night. I, I drove home, parked, got out of my car last night, and I heard an owl in the tree. And I think it's really awesome because Seven really loves owls, so I had to write. I wrote the word owl on my wrist to remind me to, to mention to Seven that there's an owl in our parking lot. But I kept thinking of the line from Futurama with Ingnert. We're owl exterminators! <laughs> Hitting the sun would be a cosmic home run. Yeah! Instant home run. You burned the ball. Let's get a new one. Where was I? Mm -hmm. Right, here we go. Victor realized that something was missing from the bizarre scene. Buildings. There were none in sight. It seemed that no one lived on the surface of this interior shell. Their homes, their offices, or workshops, or whatever were all inside the shell. Underground, so to speak. With only the entranceways visible on the surface. Like the one they had come off of. Rising direct from the bus dock. Ah, yes, Nerina said as she got her bearings. She pointed to a round pond a hundred yards away, just far enough along the curve of the shell to make Victor uneasy again, because the water looked as though it really ought to be spilling out of the bed. Sit there on that bench, she commanded. The bench was in a trellis of something like grapevines. Let me have the cat. We don't want Ballot to see it yet. Then you just stay there while I find the others and check the operating room. She was gone before he could ask her what in the world she wanted, <laughs> excuse me, what in the world she wanted an operating room for. As Victor said, and the quivers, uh, the his. Sorry, I'm having two thoughts at once. Plus, my throat's kind of sore. I don't know why my throat's kind of sore. Maybe I'm sick. <clears throat> Googling reveals he actually found several birds in embers. Creepy. I know, right? Sad day for the birds. Tiffy Hedron would be very upset. <laughs> As Victor sat, the quivers of his stomach began to settle down. The air was warm enough to be friendly, but not oppressive. There was a gentle, steady breeze, perhaps, from the rotation of the cylinder. A fair number of people were in sight, though none close enough to Victor to talk to. Near the round pond, there was a grassy meadow, where twelve or fourteen adults and children were flying huge, bright, many-colored kites, laughing and shouting as they played the fluttering things in the steady breeze. Of course, like everyone else Victor encountered these days, they were just about naked. Breech clouts, yes, they all had those, and a few wore gauzy cloaks or even hats, but that was it. And they were having fun. They weren't just flying the kites for the sake of watching them dart and wheel in the sky. They were in a contest. The kite flyers were fighting one, against, one kite against another. Some of the players were children, most were fully grown, and all of them were screaming in excitement as they tried to use the sharp edges of their own kite tails and cords to cut someone else's down. Between Victor and the kite flyers was a sort of garden. Some pale, long fruit was being harvested, maybe a kind of cucumber, Victor thought. And a crew of dwarfish hairy gillies were moving along the rows to pick the ripe fruit. They seemed to Victor larger, or at least squatter, than the ones he had seen before. As Victor watched, one of them glanced around and crammed one of the fruits into its own mouth. When it saw Victor watching, it winked at him in embarrassment. <laughs> Stealing fruit? Off with his hands! Then you'll have a monkey pot, and your wishes will come true. See, I would not want a monkey paw. People would be like, hey, would you like a magic monkey paw? And I'd be like, hell no, I'm out of here. You do not screw with magic monkey paws. <laughs> so even the gillies had privileges here. He found the thought reassuring. It emboldened him to pick a few grapes off the vines he was sitting next or sitting under. They were not very sweet, but they were deliciously cool on his tongue. When Rena came back, she was not alone. Half a dozen or more other men and women came milling out of the entranceway with her. All next door to naked, of course and all chuckling to each other and looking anticipatory. They were all strangers to Victor, almost all anyway, though one exceptionally stocky, round-faced man looked vaguely familiar. Victor was surprised to see that all of them were carrying things that looked like baseball bats. For that, for what reason, he could not guess. We're going to go beat Gillies to death. We need a new batch. <laughs> Narina introduced him all around. This is Victor, she said proudly. He was actually born on Earth. And this is Wallet, Victor. And this is his daughter, Gren. And this is Veloda, and this Mangri, Fritz's father and mother, you know, and Fortis' sister. 
Wilp and Rust, this is Palak over here, and do you remember Pelly? Recognition dawned. I do, he said. I saw your ship as we were coming in. How are you, Pelly? The man looked agreeable, but surprised. I'm very well, of course. Why do you ask? Irina laughed and interrupted, sparing Victor the trouble of finding an answer. That's how they used to talk on Old Earth, she explained. Victor's really quite civilized, though. Not like some of the others. <laughs> Apparently, asking someone how they are is rude now. How the hell do you start a conversation if you don't ask people how, you, how they are? Or do you? You just say hi and then move on? Well, that's what I do. I'm not very good at this conversation thing. Hmm? Hmm. No, someone sent me a text. You need to send me the thing. Only screw with monkey paws if you are very, very, very specific in your wishes, and then it's still 50 50 will blow up in your face. <laughs> On a monkey paw, every finger is the middle finger. They didn't shake hands either, Victor discovered, although several of them did, did hug in greeting, and one of the men kissed his cheek, which one Victor could not have said. Of all the dozen names Victor had been given, he retained none, though the other party guests all seemed to know each other. I'm like that. Hit me with a string of names and I'll remember your face and be like, hey, you. <laughs> I don't remember what I call you. You're Mambo number five. Arachnid! He's giving me licks. I got spider licks. That's... Interesting. <laughs> Where was I? Then Narina handed him one of the clubs. He almost dropped it. Not necessarily it was heavy, but for the opposite reason. The bat was made of a sort of rigid foam, strong and soft to the touch, that weighed almost nothing. A soft thwack across his own back made him jump and whirl. It was the little girl, Gren, giggling as she swung at him again. He fended the attack off with his own club, careful not to hit the girl. The blow hadn't hurt at all, but he was very unsure of just what was going on. Her father, Wallet, nodded approvingly, grinning as he took practice swings with his own club. We'll give it to them, all right, he exulted. Where are they, Narina? Let's go. Hold the club behind your back, you ass, she commanded, laughing at him. You too, Victor. We don't want them to see what we're doing, do we? Fritz said they'd be watching the kite battle. Yes, there they are. Oh, and look, a bellet. Isn't he a perfect little doll? <laughs> Apparently these very kind, polite people like to kill each other's kites and beat each other with foam baseball bats. Sounds fun. <clears throat> How about just stay away from monkey paws? If you need to stay, say very, very three times, just don't. <laughs> That's a three very alert. It was Wallet's turn. If you don't shut up, they'll hear us, he warned, and led the way to where two men and a young boy were watching the, bat the battling kites, their backs to the group with the clubs. The boy certainly was nice-looking, slim, pale-haired, and equivalent of an earthly ten-year-old, with the promise of good adult looks to the bones of his face. Victor frowned. Another puzzle. On the boy's pretty young forehead, there was exactly the same blue tattoo as Victor wore himself. But he had no opportunity to ask about it, for the others were all shushing each other as he moved closer. Although the boy was doggedly staring at the bobbing kites, he was also stealing glances around in every direction as though suspecting something, until one of the men with him leaned down and smiling whispered in his ear. Then Balit stopped looking around. Still, the body language of the way he stood showed that he was tensed up. But for what? There were other spectators who glanced from Belit to this approaching I'm vibrating. Oh, Facebook links are dumb. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry, I'm yelling at Seven because she needs to send me the GoFundMe link and she keeps sending me to a Facebook post. I don't need to go to a damn Facebook post. If you're not logged into Facebook, you can't see Facebook posts anyway. So send me the GoFundMe link. We are. Uh. Watching you. Yes, you can. <laughs> It's a web page, not a 
Sorry, guys, I'm, I'm arguing with seven. <laughs> I'd be reading, but I'm arguing with seven because she's trying to send me this thing and she keeps sending me Facebook crap. I can't see anything on Facebook. All right, finally, got it. What's the code on this? See, that's not hard at all. <laughs> I got this. Okay, guys, we're going to take a short pause. Um, and the reason why is because I want to share this with you guys. <sighs> so it's going to be... I'm going to note this down in the thing here really quick. Sorry guys, I'm doing science. You guys like science, right? We'll do some music while I'm doing science. It's really quick. There. I can't type on this damn phone. My fingers are too big. Okay. So I'm going to throw you guys a, um, a GoFundMe link. You are not under any obligation or circumstances required to help or assist in any way. But Seven asked me to print these for her work. So I'm going to also do the thing that you're supposed to do, which is share it on the interwebs. So there is the link. It's for a friend of Seven. Well, not of just a friend. It's a, he's a co-worker of Seven's. Um, and so this is what you're supposed to do, right? So I also posted it on my um, internet thing. I want a streaming radio program that will let me play the music at slower speeds. That way I can play slow jazz at half speed so it's real slow jazz. Oh, yeah. Wait, doesn't YouTube let you do that? We are. I don't know if YouTube lets you change the speed or not. Watching Probably not. you. Yeah. Well, that's fast. Here you go. YouTube lets you do it. Oh god, that's so bad. Wait, now I have to find some slow jazz. Wait, we gotta. <laughs> we have to try this. Um, slow jazz. All right, we're gonna find some slow jazz. <laughs> let's find some slow jazz. All right, here we go. This is the one I listened to before, so let's. Okay, here's some slow jazz. This is regular speed. And I guess we're going to do slow jazz at half speed. Now that's some slow jazz. You know, apart from the, the drops, that doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> you think your jazz is slow, huh? Beatles used to record slow so they could play some things fast. Yeah. You know, it can go even slower, right? 0.25, quarter speed. Can't even hear it, it's so slow. <laughs> the distance between notes are like the distance between stars. <laughs> there you go. Three quarter speed. That sounds like regular jazz while you're walking away from the radio at point nine 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 times the speed of light. <laughs> so there you go. Half speed. Ha <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that trumpet sounds so sad. <laughs> Watch this. Now, see, now the slow jazz doesn't seem so slow. Good times. <laughs> anyway, there's some slow, there's some slow jazz for you. All right, seven wanted me to print this guy, so give me one second. I don't know how I'm supposed to print this actually. Printing this is going to become problematic. Uh. Yeah, these page ranges are not meant for printing. One second. Oh, I'll put the slow jazz back on for you guys and really torture your asses. <laughs> Wait. There you go. Can you get any smoother? Probably not. Sorry, I'm texting Seven. This is kind of important for us, so we're gonna have to wait a minute, guys. I do apologize. Actually, it really doesn't sound that bad this slow. Now that I feel really stoked, like like I'm like hardcore waiting for the next note. You know, I was never a big fan of, uh, what the hell is that movie? Now I can't remember the name, because I got titties in my face. <laughs> okay, Seven's not replied to me, so I'm thinking I'm destroying her dreams. So at some point today, I'm going to have to figure this crap out. I do apologize, guys. Um, like I said, Seven wants me to do this because she doesn't know how. Um, best I can do is an attempt. Because she wants me to print it. She's like, hey, can you print it? And I'm like, I, no. So I'm going to have to make a flyer. I hate flyers. Flyers make me sad. Free art, guys. Okay, we'll get back to the game. This makes me want to listen to more stuff at slow speed, though, you know? <laughs> Alright, thank you everybody for your patience. We'll get back to the story time now. So those jazzers are doing the equals Lily slow stripper dance? Oh, yeah. Well, she kept her clothes on, so I don't know how... Oh, yeah, that really is. Alright, what was I? Okay, I'm going to start from this paragraph because I know we're in the middle of it. There were other spectators who glanced from Belit to the approaching group with expressions of amused tolerance. The two men with Belit kept their eyes steadfastly on the kites in the sky. As they approached, Victor saw that one of the men was as tall as himself, though as slightly built as these people. He had both mustaches and beard, all waxed or sprayed or some other house swept out of the majestic and improbable long curves. The other man, smaller and even more delicately built, had one hand on the boy's head and the other tucked into the hand of his companion. His beard was far shorter and less conspicuous, but at the same, excuse me, all the same, it was definitely a beard. 
Suddenly confused, Victor whispered to Rena, Who are those two guys? Frit and Forte, of course, Billy's parents. Oh, for a minute I thought they were both men. They are both men, Victor. Do be quiet. Oh, Victor had said again, feeling his eyes beginning to bulge. One more surprise. He could have expected almost anything of these people, but what he had not expected in all was that Belit's parents should both be male. You could do it. I mean, genetic sequence contains both male and female DNA. You just take the, you know. Hello, Dragon Eye. Welcome. Hey, sexy is sexy even with clothes. No, sexy is sexier. There's a little Lilo smoke sex. Sexy is sexier with clothes. Clothing tucks things in, covers things up, smooths things out. You take off the clothes, things begin to bulge and plump and sag. <laughs> so, you know, clothes are better, man. Gotta love Selma Hayek. I'm okay with that Selma Hayek thing, so. But, you know, hot famous people are so far out of my league, I'm like, nope. What was I? Then things got even more surprising. Now we attack. Show no quarter, Nina. Sh <laughs> Nina shouted joyously, and her whole band began to run towards the little family, waving their clubs. Don't you dare try to resist, Nina ordered ferociously, thwacking the taller man happily across his shoulders with a horn spat. We've come to steal your child, and you dare not try to stop us. But both men, but both the men, laughing, were already resisting. They whirled around, pulling soft clubs of their own out of the waistbands of their breech clouds. And defending themselves vigorously against the combined attack of Marina's band of marauders, a couple of blows hit Victor, who was blinking in confusion as he was thrust into the middle of the fracas. Of course, the clubs didn't hurt. It was almost like being hit with a helium-filled balloon. The foam-like clubs were incapable of hurting anyone, and there was no doubt of the outcome. It was two against a dozen, after all. The bystanders were cheering and egging both sides on as the outnumbered parents slowly fell back, leaving the boy stranded, tense, and smiling anxiously behind them. Pick him up, Victor, and Rena commanded, laughing breathlessly in pursuit. Go on, do it! You're much stronger than any of us, so you can be the one to carry him away. What made Victor follow her orders was that the boy seemed to acquiesce. He moved toward Victor, smiling tentatively and holding out his arms. And so Victor Sorokane, 4,000 years out of his time, found himself in the act of kidnapping a child on a man-made habitat that circled the brown dwarf Nergal. Well, why not? He thought wryly. Nothing else made sense. Why should this? Maybe got a bit deeper than we needed. <laughs> That's what your mom said. <laughs> Damn it, every time. <laughs> Onward. <laughs> you know, my jokes, your jokes are funnier if you don't laugh at them. Do not laugh. See, every comedian will tell you, do not laugh at your own jokes. Do not laugh at your own jokes, ever. You know, laugh with the crowd. If the crowd, la crowd laughs, you laugh. But never laugh at your own jokes. I can't help it. I laugh at my own jokes. I'm funny. <laughs> uh. But are they also here to drink their beer and to take their rum at the point of a gun and will their alcohol to them will fall? <laughs> I have no idea, Spoon. The band of kidnappers broke off their battle and flocked after Victor, shouting in triumph while they despoiled parents watched proudly after them. The whole abducting mob hurried into one of the entranceways. Then Narina told Victor to put the boy down. I'll take him from now on, she said indulgently. Did you meet Victor Belit? He was frozen for a long time, you know. He was actually on Old Earth. Imagine. He'll tell you all about it at the party, I'm sure. Hello, Victor, the boy said politely, and then looked plaintively at Narina. Is it going to hurt, Aunt Narina? Hurt? Of course it won't hurt, Belit, she scolded indulgently. Well, it'll take five minutes, that's all. Then it will all be over, and besides... You'll be asleep while I'm doing it. Now come to the operating room and... Oh, I've got the most wonderful coming-of-age present for you. If I remember right, you can choose your gender. So how this works or some crap like that. An hour later, the party was in full swing. Belid was sitting on a kind of throne on top of the buffet table, a glass of wine in his hand, Nerina's gift purring gently in his lap, and a garland of flowers on his head. While his captors and his parents and several dozen other people who had shown up from nowhere drank and ate and joked and sang and congratulated Bleed on his new status as a man. Victor had never seen a young boy look more pleased, though he noticed that Bleed did from time to time surreptitiously reach down to touch his genitals as though to make sure they were still there. They were, as good as new. It was simply that through Narina's quick and expert minor surgery they were no longer capable of producing live sperm. Ah, that's what it was, yeah. 
It's what every male does when he gets close to puberty, while it explained heartily, refilling Victor's glass. That way he doesn't have to worry about, you know, making someone really... What was the word? Yes, pregnant. He gazed fondly at his daughter, who was teasingly stroking the kitten in Belit's lap, and a little of Belit, too. It makes the girls a little jealous, while it said. They have a coming-of-age party, too, of course, but they don't have the jolly old fighting and the kidnapping and the carrying away, and that's what makes this kind of party so special. Don't you agree? Oh, yes, Victor said politely. Uh, well, it... That mark on the boy's forehead. The fertility mark, yes. What about it? Oh, I see you've got one, too. Well, Belit shouldn't have intercourse now for a few weeks, you know, until any live sperm in his tract dissipate, and they'll take the brand off. Hasn't Rena told you all this? I guess she would do you, too, if you asked her to. I mean, now that you're not donating anymore. Oh, here comes Pelly. Victor was not at his best, greeting the bloated-looking space captain. He was not used to the, faith, to the fact that everyone he met seemed to know all about the state of his genital systems. All he could say was, in a rush, Pelly, I really want to talk to you. About Nibu, I know. The man growled good-naturedly. Narina warned me you would. Let's get out of this noise, though. Suppose we pick up a couple of drinks, and then we can go over there and sit by the edge of the pond. <coughs> hmm? <laughs> Did I just hear genitals? I hope you didn't hear genitals. Genitals shouldn't make any kind of sound. Well, I mean, not alone. Now, if genitals are together... You know, one pair over here, and one pair over there, and then they come together and collide like two astral bodies in a storm, then they should make all sorts of noise. But by themselves, genitals should be generally quiet. <laughs> I want to discuss something with the genitals. <laughs> Sorry, Caps was on. You know, too bad human speech... And this may become a thing in the future with robots. I would do this with robots. If I if I ever had to program robots in the future, I would have a random number generator embedded in them that every once in a while their caps lock would come on. Basically, they would shout random sentences. <laughs> because it, imagine, I mean, it's sort of like having Tourette's, but it only occurs on the internet where people will talk, they'll say something, they'll hit enter... And before they realize they've typed it all out in caps, they're literally screaming at a room full of people. And you're like, what? And imagine for a moment you're standing there in a group of people and some guy in this nice quiet room in a library and a bar and a pub. Somebody is just sitting there and he just suddenly screams out as loud as he possibly can. I have to go pee! <laughs> it's just like, okay, dude, enjoy. <laughs> I don't know why the whole room needed to know that, but hey, whatever, dude. <laughs> so I would do that. If we ever had robots, I would program them to randomly shout. <sighs> what was I? Uh, uh. Mm. Sorry, I have more text coming in. <laughs> I can't spell where the damn Sorry, I'm replying to a text and I have really big fingers. <laughs> Sorry, replying to text. KB, okay, click, 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 click. Continue the story. The story is nuts. Oh, we'll continue the story. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm a very busy person these days, apparently. That is... Oh, I do hope no one was inside that. <laughs>
What idiot turned on the MRI machine with a metal cabinet in the room? Oh, I think it's going to need repairs. Lots of repairs. And a whole lot of 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 re uh, readjusting. Why? Why would so why why would someone do that? Why would someone do that? Flipping nurses. Actually, I don't blame a nurse. I was probably an intern that did that. <sighs> anyway, onward with the story. It wasn't just Nibu that Victor wanted to talk about, but Pele was easy. He seemed almost to admire Victor. Well, naturally enough, he explained, You, Victor, you've really traveled all the way from Old Earth. And I've ever all I've ever done is cruise around its little system. Watching you. So it wasn't just the fizzy, faintly faintly tart, mildly fruity drinks they were putting away that made Victor feel good. He had become used to being a curiosity, but it had been a long, long time since he had felt himself admired. He glanced back at the coming of age party, which was increasing and multiplying as a random passerby came by. That was a really odd sentence. Passerby came by and joined in and stayed. Nerina was showing Belit how to feed the kitten out of the improvised bottle she had made. Frit, from the top of the banquet table, was declaiming, <laughs> declaiming a poem. The MRI machine probably was already on, and some idiot wheeled the card in. Rebooting an MRI costs about ten thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, plus if you notice the the leg restraints on the bed, one of them was heavily damaged. They're gonna have to replace and refit the bed, because that thing probably flew with that magnet at a, at that distance. I'd say anywhere between ten and twenty miles an hour. Ten thousand dollars plus copay. <laughs> uh, Marina said you had some ar artifacts you'd picked up from Nibu, Victor said. Pallius shook his head. Oh no, not me. I mean, I didn't pick the things up personally. I've never landed on Nibu, and I never will. But I do have this thing I carry it around to show people. He fumbled in his pouch and handed Victor a bit of something that was metal bright but a pale lavender in color. Victor turned the thing over. It was astonishingly light from metal, a rod about the size of his finger, tapering to, a round, tapering to round at one end and the other end cracked and jagged. Is it hollow? he asked, hefting it. No, it's what you see. And don't ask me what it's for, because I don't know. Pelle restored it to his pouch, and then had a change of mind. I know. I'll give it to Belit for a coming-of-age present. There are plenty more of these things. Not here, of course, but on New Manholm. He peered keenly at Victor, and the moon face split in a smile. I'm going back there in a few days, you know. Really? To New Manholm? To tell the truth, Pelle admitted. I'm looking forward to it. I'm generally happier on the ship than I am here, and maybe because I'm pure, you know? I mean, he explained... Nobody tinkered with my genes before I was born. Not much, anyway, outside of, you know, getting rid of the genetic diseases and that sort of thing. I probably wouldn't even need have needed the muscle builders and things to be on New Man Home, except for growing up on a habitat. But I was always a lot heavier than the other boys. I didn't know there were any other any like you anymore, Victor said. There aren't many. Maybe that's why I like space. Maybe I like... Maybe I take after the ones who originally came here, you know? You've seen their ships? Can you imagine the courage of them? What's the matter? I haven't seen those ships. I wish I could. Oh, but that's easy enough, Pelly said, grinning. From his shoulder bag, he pulled out a flat board, glassy topped like the teaching desks. He touched the tiny keypad. There it is, he said, for, uh, ruefully. <laughs> Pathetic, isn't it? Victor bent over to study the picture. Pathetic was the right word. A single hydroxy-propelled rocket, tiny in the screen, but certainly not very large in any case. It was orbiting with ruddy Nergal hung below it. Excuse me, huge below it. And as Pelly manipulated the keypad to move the scene forward in time, the ship was joined by another, and another, more than a dozen in all, linking together in a sprawling mass of nested spaceships. Victor could see years of history happening in minutes as the ship's deployed solar mirrors began to reshape themselves. That was the first habitat, Pelly told him. Altogether, only 800 people made it to Nergal, and that was all they could build ships for. The rest, I guess, just stayed there and died. Things got better when they began constructing real habitats out of asteroidal materials, but for a long time they damn near starved. Then, once there was some sort of plague, and most of the ones around then died of that, he swept his arm around the scene around about them. Did you know that all of us are descended from exactly 91 people? That's all there were left after the plague. But then it began to get better. He flicked off the screen and looked at Victor, seeming a little abashed. Does all this bore you? Hi, Panda! been gone for six weeks because of summer camp, but I'm back now. Welcome back, Panda. Good to see you again. I'm glad you're here. I was sad and lonely without you. Only you would drive me forward to continue to stream. None of these others matter. Let's elope. loop. <laughs> Sorry. Got ahead of myself. 
Summer camp can be creepy. I hope you had a good time. Summer camp is only creepy if you let it be creepy. It was more annoying than creepy. Yeah, see, I, I, I can understand that. I only ever went to day camp. I never went to, like, any kind of overnight camp. I like sleeping in my bed. Thank you. Oh no, Victor cried. Honestly, Pelly, it's what I've been trying to find out ever since Narina thawed me out. Listen, what about the time dilation effect? Pelly blinked politely. I beg your pardon. The basic question, I mean. The reason all this happened in the first place. The way our little group of stars took off at relativistic speeds. I've been trying to figure it out. The only thing I can think is that we were traveling so fast that time dilation took over for a long time, Pelly. I can't even guess how long. Long enough so that all the stars went through their life cycles and died while we were traveling. Victor stopped because Pelly's eyes were beginning to glaze. Oh yes, Pelly said, beginning to fidget as he glanced around. Darina said you said things like that. But don't you see? It's all linked together. The structures on Nibu, the Sorokane Tiga objects, the foreshortening of the optical universe, the absence of all the stellar objects, but a handful now. Victor, Pelly said, his voice good-natured enough but also quite definite. I'm a space pilot, not a poet. Ask me anything about practical matters and I'm happy to talk as long as you like. But this... This... This sort of, well, mystical stuff? It's just not what I'm interested in. Anyway, he finished holding up his empty glass. We need ref refills now, don't we? And they're beginning to dance again. Let's say we join them. I'm not sending my kids to summer camp. Well, rude, KB. What? What? I like to sleep in my own bed. Hmm. <laughs> uh. I just had to show the love to Panda. He's been gone for six weeks. I had to just let it all out. All over his face. <laughs> they make you drink water every ten minutes because it's so hot, and make you pee every fifteen minutes because you're full of water. <laughs> it took two more glasses of mild, bubbly stuff before Victor was ready to accept defeat. Ah, uh, well, he told himself. It was too much to hope for real understanding for many of these people. All they cared about, obviously, was having fun. But halfway through the second glass, fun began to seem worth having, even to someone on whom, alone, the burden of solving the riddle of the universe seemed to rest. Narina was leading an open circle of scores of people, dancing around the guests of Honor's throne, laughing. She waved to Victor to join them. Why not? He swallowed the rest of his drink. Then he trotted to the line and took over Narina's position. A fuzzy drink probably had something to do with that. Victor wasn't in the habit of taking over a lead spot among strangers, especially when, in this thistle town gravity, his steps were balloon-like rather than the macho stomps he liked best. Nevertheless, everyone followed as he led them, patiently but firmly, in a sort of loose, watered-down Hin Matov, leaving out the tricky Yemeni figures. <laughs> Just step bend and running steps until everyone in the line had grasped it and was laughing and out of breath. That was nice, Narina told him breathlessly, throwing her arms around him at the end. Kiss, Victor! And while they were kissing, the proud father came up to them, beaming. Victor, I didn't know you were a dancer. And before Victor had a chance to be modest, the man was rushing on. I'm Frit. I'm so glad Narina brought you. We haven't had a chance to meet, but I wanted to thank you for helping with Belize's party. He squeezed Victor's arm. Imagine, none of his friends ever had a person from Earth carry them away. It would be the envy of his whole cohort. It was nothing, Victor said graciously. Narina patted his shoulder affectionately and strolled away. Victor hardly noticed. He was staring in fascination at Fritz's mustache. At close range, they were even more of a marvel. They extended beyond his shoulders on both sides, and although Victor was sure he had seen one of them bent in the mock scuffle and was now repaired, and it stood proudly as before. It did not at all match Fritz's hair, either. At a distance, Victor had thought the man was wearing a white cap, but it was actually close-cropped white kinks from the standard image of an old Pullman porter, though Fritz's skin was alabaster. You must meet Forta, Frit went on, beckoning to the well, Victor thought, I guess they would say to the other father. Though, how all that worked out, he couldn't imagine. This is Victor, dear, Frit told his mate. Nerina says he's very interested in the stars and all. Yes, she told me, Forta said, demurely offering his shoulder to hug. Do you know what we should do, Frit? We should ask Victor to come and stay with us for a while. Belita already asked me if we could. He was just thrilled at being kidnapped by somebody from Old Earth. I know Belit would love to show all him off to his friends. <laughs> yes, dear, Fritz said tolerantly. But what would Victor think of that? We can't expect him to spend his time with a bunch of kids. Victor blinked and then said, suddenly hopeful, I'd really like to talk to you about what happened to the universe if it wouldn't be a burden. Burden? Forda echoed. No, certainly it wouldn't be a burden. We'd love to have you come home with us and... He hesitated then grinned modestly. Since you're interested in dancing, shall I dance for you now? 
Fritz just finished a new poem in honor of Belit's coming of age. It's about growth and maturity. And I've done the dance accompaniment. Please do, Victor said. He was completely out of it, really. He was wholly confused about what, he had been, what had been going on and what was to come. But he was game. He didn't, after all, have many other options. Hmm? Are we having an issue with our thing? Touching our stuff? Cerberus Puppy welcomes you to the gates of heck. <laughs> ah, the gates of heck. Good place. I go there on my summer trips. I don't go inside, I just chill at the gate and feed the dog. Chapter 25 When Wan Tu became aware that a fresh burst of tachyons had struck his receptors, he did not respond very quickly. He didn't do anything very quickly these days. It took him a while to switch from one mode of activity to another. Torpidly, almost groaning in protest, he bestirred himself to see what his latest batch of tachyons was like. Naturally, his detectors had recorded them in a case in case he wanted to examine them in detail, although that was probably hardly worth the trouble. It wouldn't have been if he had had anything more worthwhile to do. Bantu was not excited about the event. He had lost the habit of excitement in this dead universe where there was no light, no x-rays, no cosmic rays, no anything but the distant purring popping sound of the protons of his own star as they gave up the ghost. Even so, it wasn't unusual for batches of stray radiation of one kind or another to reach him. Infrequent, yes. Everything was infrequent these days, but not startling. Such things were simply the, the showers of particles that were the ghosts of some immense stellar catastrophes from long ago, from the time when any immense event could still happen in this morbid universe. But this time... This time... This time it was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to Wan Tu in a very long time indeed. Although he could hardly believe it at first, he was soon certain that this was no random burst of particles. It was a message. A message. <laughs> Sorry. Speaking of messages, I got more texts. Sorry, replying to a text. I know I'm very busy on my Saturdays. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> ah. Anyway, back to what I was doing. Something about one two. Oh yeah. It was a wonder that one two could read the message at all. The coded pulses were of the very lowest energy tachyons, therefore almost the fastest of all, and yet they had taken a long time to reach him. So vast had the always-expanding universe become in ten to the fortieth years. They had to have been transmitted with considerable power, too. Wantu knew this to be true, not merely because of the distance they had traveled, but because he observed that the tachyons had not been transmitted in a tight and economical beam. They had been broadcast. Broadcast. So the sender hadn't known where he was. But they were definitely meant for one, too. The opening pulse had said so. That fact was as much of a thrill to one, too, as the first ecstatic sight of a sail on the horizon to any shipwrecked mar mariner. Impossible, though, it was to believe, even now, in this terminal coma of the universe, there was someone somewhere who had something to say to him. But what was this message? To find that out was a labor in requiring much energy out of one, two's thunder store, as well as a great deal of long, hard concentration. The message had come in very fast, the whole burst had taken only a matter of seconds, and had it been many ages since Wan Tu had been able to operate at that speed. He had almost forgotten what it was like to do things at the speed of nuclear reactions. In order to interpret the message at all, he had to slow it down by order of magnitude and ponder its meaning bit by bit. Then too, although the message had been stored automatically for examination at its own pace, the poverty of Wan Tu's resources meant that even the basic storage was sketchy. Some sections of the message seemed to be missing. Some of the content was doubtful. Wantu found it necessary to reactivate large parts of his mind from inactive storage to help in puzzling out what the message meant, 
and what it and that in itself was a considerable drain on his meager strength. But in the final analysis, it, he didn't need to read it all. The signature alone was enough to tell him nearly all there was to know. It had come from the long-forgotten idiot, the one who he had charged with sending a little flock of stars on a wild goose chase. Matter copy number five. Five stars were still alive. As long ago, stars had been careening through space so fast that time dilation had frozen them nearly immobile. They had not aged. They hadn't rotted into decay with the rest of the universe. In a universe where everything else had decayed into stagnant death, they were still young and bursting with power. One, two has five targets! Chapter 26 Moon Mary was a natural moon, well, a formerly natural moon, now terraformed and made lovely, along with the myriad of habit myriad habitats it orbited around. The brown dwarf Nergal. Fortin needs a moon needs a moon's gravity, Frit explained on the way. Dancers have to have a lot of muscles, you know. If he can dance here, he can dance anywhere. Well, not on the planet or anything like that, but on any of the other moons or the habitats. The exercise will be good for your leg while it heals too. Besides, we've got a lot of data in our store for it to put in hospitably. I'm sure you'll find all sorts of interesting things in it. And Belit said with excitement, Look over there, Victor. That's Moon Mary. Watch how we come in. Oh, Victor, I do love being in space. <laughs> you can dance if you want to. You can leave your friends behind. Victor did watch. It was worth watching. They didn't simply land. Moon Mary was not left wide open to the universe. It couldn't be, since it didn't have enough gravitation to hold a breathable air. Hold a breathable air. I like that. I think he meant hold a breathable atmosphere. <laughs> to land, their little ship had to slide through an opening that appeared magically in the atmosphere, holding radiation shielding force field that kept the people who lived on Moon Mary safe. As soon as Victor stood up, his bad leg told him he wasn't in a habitat gra mini gravity anymore. It hurt when he put his weight on it. He winced. But this was more like it. It wasn't a habitat. It was practically a planet. The buildings stuck up on the surface as they ought to, and there was a real sky. Actually, the sky wasn't real at all, for if you had subtracted the force shield, that re what remained would have been terrible. The shield diminished the intensity of the ruddy glow of Nergal. It might also, Victor thought critically at first, have diminished the capacity to extract solar energy from Nergal, but it turned out they didn't need that. Moon Mary was packed with geothermal energy, easily extracted through steam wells. The satellite was, also, was so close to its primary immense Nergal that it was under constant gravitational flexing and stress from Nergal's great mass and so its interior was constantly being heated by friction, comp uh, compression, and strain. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, just giving myself a stretch. And throwing a text out really quick. <laughs> Nicely done, Mike. Nicely done, indeed. Or was I? <laughs> yeah. Of course, experience had taught Victor that there was a black lining to every silver cloud. He found what the bad side of the moon Mary's geothermal activity was very quickly. They were hardly out of the spaceport when Victor felt the ground shudder beneath him. Bleak giggled. Forta smiled tolerantly, and Frit explained, Just an earthquake, Victor. We have them all the time. But we're used to them, Forta added. Truly, there's no danger. When Victor saw that his hosts lived in a pencil-thin tower 30 stories high, he swallowed. He took a glass-walled elevator, which slid rapidly up to the outside of the tower, letting him see just how far they were soaring above the high ground, excuse me, hard ground. In the elevator, he swallowed again, and was glad when it slowed gently to their floor, and Forta politely opened the door for him. Once inside their apartment, everything was reassuringly stable. They seemed to have the whole floor to themselves. All the rooms except the sanitary facilities were outside rooms, which meant that they had curved walls and large windows looking out the out blah, 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 looking out on the park-like gardens outside, with Red Nergal hanging huge over half the sky. He swallowed. Excuse me. He allowed them to point out the room that would be his, and he kept Forda and Belit company as they pulled meals out of the freezer and set the table. Until another sudden shiver of the whole structure made him grab for the back of a chair. You'll get used to it, Victor, Belit said, trying to show amusement. We're quite safe here. 
all our buildings are designed for this sort of thing, Ford added. How do you turn your caps lock on on your phone? Sorry guys, it's a really busy day for me. I really do apologize. It's one of those things. I cannot type. Maybe you are excellent today. Well, thank you, Lilo. I, I'm sorry, I just I keep taking breaks and I don't mean to. I'm getting near the end of the book. I'm starting to kind of just wander off in my mind. I'm busy texting stuff. Seven has some stuff she wants me to do, and I'm just I'm trying to keep up with everything. Saturdays are not my best day. <laughs> Press shift twice. Nothing. What am I supposed to be doing here? Oh, right. <laughs> just tapping. The, what are you talking about, Jinx? I don't understand what's going on. No, I, I know that, but I, I, what I meant by like, how do I do it is I've never accidentally you know, turned on caps lock on my phone before. Purpose, yes, but never on accident. <laughs> uh, I'm, a bra I'm brain dead. Hmm. Anyway, back to the book. It took a while for Victor to believe it, but it was true enough. Of course, he knew that the problem of the earthquakes had even been solved back on Earth itself, in the pre-Toyota Japan of the 19th century, uh, 19th century and earlier. Since earthquakes could knock buildings down, you didn't want any building that might fall on you and crush you to death. Those early Japanese found a satisfactory solution for their time. Build everything out of the flimsiest material you can, and don't smoke in bed. Though when the 20th century came along, with lessons, those lessons didn't apply anymore. Technological man had possessions. A home needed to be a place to store the possessions, as well as a place to sleep and eat. Pre-industrial Japan had handled it by having as few possessions as possible, and those light and sturdy... Their grandchildren, however, lived in Toyota, Sony, Nissan, Japan, and they wanted more. They wanted to own a large number of tangible things, even if they were large and heavy. They wanted homes that could house their washer, dryer, stereos, jacuzzis, king-sized beds with interspring mattresses, radar ovens, food processors, and VCRs. They wanted flush toilets. They wanted built-in garages and electronic stoves. All those new wants made hard work for the architects. Plumbing? Well, yes, but water intakes and sewage outlets meant underground networks of pipes that, and conduits that could rupture in even a moderate earthquake. They wanted high-rises, which meant elevators and some very heavy structure, uh, structural members that could fall on inhabitants unless built with sophisticated skill and attention to the harmonics of the natural frequencies of the earthquake shocks. Paper and bamboo went out, sprung flexible steel, pre-stressed concrete, and curtain walls came in. Now the time the people on Moon Mary began to build in earnest, all those old lessons were learned over again. To be sure, those latter-day architects were helped a great deal by Mary's light gravity. There simply didn't have to be that much mass involved in support columns. They were helped even more by high technology. Chips replaced tangles of wires, transformable walls served as windows or temperature control devices, water recycling saved a lot of plumbing, and what couldn't be avoided was flexible and tough. When, during Victor's first night on Moon Mary, he woke to find the whole building swaying, he was the only one in it who jumped out of bed. Everyone else slept right through, even young Belit. The next morning, they laughed at him for his fears. <laughs> You're a coward, human! <laughs> Smoking in bed is great. Yeah, when you fall asleep, you can burn alive. <laughs> That's not a good thing. Technically, you will only be alive for half the burning. <laughs> They laughed quite politely, though. They were always polite. Helpful was another thing. They did their best, but to, Victor, to Victor's crushed surprise, they had little help to give. These people, whom Narina had touted to him as the most knowledgeable alive, didn't even know the vocabulary of astrophysical research. Spectroscopy, Fritz said, sounding the word out. Spectroscopy. That's a really pretty word, Victor. I must use it in a poem. 
and it means something about finding out what a star is like. It means measuring the bands of light and dark in a spectrum from a star so that you can identify all the elements and ions present, Victor said darkly, gazing at, at the man who had been advertised to know all these things. Ion spectrum. Oh, Victor, Fritz said with delight. You're just full of wonderful words I can use. Forta, come in here, please. We're going to find some spectroscopy in our files for dear Victor. But as it turned out, they didn't. They couldn't, or not in any easy way, at least. Between the two of them, Fritz and Forta managed to get their data retrieval desk to turn up several hundred references to one astronomical term or another, but spectroscope was not among them. Neither was spectroscopy, nor even the field terms cosmology or astrophysics. True, there were a long list of citations under such promising words as nova and supernova and black hole and even hertzsprung russell diagram, but when tracked down, all the references were to plays, paintings, musical compositions, poems, some by Fritz himself, and dances, frequently by Forta. It's only programmed for the things we're really interested in, Forta apologized. And actually, just to give Victor kind of a punch in the grill, it's been 4,000 years, give or take, and when it was only 400 years, not 4,000, when it was only 400 years, all the stars in the universe had boiled down to a bright pinpoint of light in the sky. Do you know what a spectroscope of that would show? Nothing. Or everything. I'm not entirely certain which. I mean, I guess if you pointed the spectroscope at it, you'd get like a reading from it, but the reading would be a jumble of a thousand stars in a pinprick of space. It's it would be impossible to get any readings of it. Of course you don't have anything like supernova or spectroscopy or any of that crap. And the reason why is because you can't observe it if all you're looking at is a bright white spot in the sky. Even if people hadn't we gone all psycho-religious about it and said, no, we don't talk about it, we don't look at, look at it, that's God's thing and we don't screw with that stuff. Even if they'd stared at it every day and tried to study it every day, you still couldn't get readings from it. It'd just be a big bright spot in the sky. It'd be like, it would act like a, stu a sun. That's what it would act like. It would act like one big, ugly sun in your sky that gave off no heat, just a crap ton of light. And so Victor's like, well, why don't you have any of these words? It's like, because the words lost meaning. First, the universe boiled down into a point of light, and then it just vanished. It means nothing. These words mean nothing. They're words. We have them. We use them. But what they were used for before aren't what they're used for now. A spectrometer can see RGB values. But again, you're staring at the entire universe as a pinpoint of light. That's going to screw you up. I mean, even at our distances, every every galaxy we see, we can at least define it. We can see one side of it or the other. We can even see individual stars within them. A little bit. But in, in this description, it was literally, it looked like a star in the sky. <laughs> anyway. Victor couldn't believe their failure. He was the only disappointed person, though. Frit and Forta were enthralled. Great transporter, Forta called in delight. I didn't know we had this sort of material here. Perhaps it's from Belit's school file. But see here, Frit, isn't this beautiful? He was looking at a 500-year-old painting of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. I can't think why people have let this be forgotten. Why do you think, Frit? All these star colors for a new dance. Don't you think they look marvelous on my costume? Frit patted his mate's arm fondly, but he was peering at the diagram on the desk. I don't think I know what it means, he admitted. It shows the slope of the mass-luminosity relation, Victor explained. You can see how stars develop, and their color depends on the temperature of the photosphere, anywhere from red through yellow, white to blue. Exactly, Forta cried, hardly listening. I will dance the aging of a star. See, I'll start out big, he mimicked being big, lifting his shoulders, puffing his cheeks, arcing his arms up and up and before him. And then the lighting will be blue, then green, then yellow and smaller for a long time. Is that right, Victor? Then big again and red. You'll be lovely, Fritz said with pride. He smiled at their son politely, silent as the grown-ups talked. Don't you think Forta could make a lovely star dance? He always does, Belit said loyally, but keeping his eyes on Victor. Port aside, but I'm afraid we're not go giving our friend Victor what he wants. There just isn't much of that sort of thing in the current files. Victor pricked up his ears. Are there others? Of course, there's always the old data banks on New Man Home, Fritz said, looking surprised. Only they aren't very convenient, you know? Because they're old. They aren't here. The age of the internet. <laughs> I'm going to put them on the internet yesterday, and it's on a server way over there. Ew. <laughs> I don't have to go to the library to read. Can I access them, Victor demanded. 
Pritt looked at him with the expression of a, of a host whose guest had just requested a bigger bedroom or a rare brand of tea. I'm not sure if I know how you could do that, he said thoughtfully. Forta? I suppose it's possible, Victor, Forta said doubtfully. They go back a long time, though. All the way back to when everybody still lived on New Manhome. When we built the habitats thousands of years ago, everything was shiny new, you know, and the data retrieval system were all redesigned. The ones we use now aren't really compatible with the ones on New Manhome. And besides, there's hardly anyone there. On New Manhome, Victor repeated. Forta nodded. It's a nasty place to live, with everything weighing so much. People don't like to go there. Except funny ones like Pelly. He added laughingly. So the old records might as well not exist, don't you see? Elid, watching their guest with concern, squirmed away from their parents' fondly patting, fondly patting hand. We do have the paintings, Victor, the boy piped up. And when Victor looked inquiringly at Belit's parents, Forta said with pride, Yes, of course, there are some wonderful paintings of the Starburst, for instance. It was still in the sky, oh, up to six or eight hundred years ago. Then it just gradually began to fade, and then the sun came back. That must have been an exciting time, Fritz said wistfully. Of course, we weren't born then. Forta thought that over. I don't know if I'd say exciting, exactly. I know people did talk about it quite a lot once they noticed it. And there was the art. I remember my mother taking me to... Whose performance was it? I think it was Ding Lord's? Yes. That's what it was. It was a dance play about the sun returning. I was just a child. Hadn't even had my coming-of-age party yet, but... He smiled bashfully at Victor. It was certainly important to me. I think Ding Lord's play was what made my mind up to be a dancer myself. <laughs> See? The stars can, can make you creative, even if they're... Dying as a starburst in the sky because some alien creature threw your stars into the universe as a distraction so his brothers wouldn't shoot at him. <laughs> okay. You know, when you put it that way, it gets weird. Well, I'm in Star Citizen. I can't listen to you. That sucks. Well, there's another reason to ban that game. Star Citizen doesn't let you use other programs while you're running Star Citizen. That's bad coding. <laughs> Given their speed, it would be extremely redshifted, though, probably even below the visible spectrum into infrared or microwave. Yeah. When you shine the light from the whole universe through a spectrum, you get the whole spectra of light. Spectral lines depending on the element contents of the whole universe at that point. Wait, I mixed up spectrum and prism. Prism. Yeah, prism. You shine it. You shine the light through a prism, and it creates a spectrum. Watch Cosmos. Listen to the great, sexy voice of. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, as he tells you all sorts of cool things like Spectrum and, you know, cool stuff like that. <laughs> ah, good times. As a family's guest expert on the care and feeding of primitive or... You know, I've had this problem since I was a teenager. Whenever I see the word organism, my brain converts it to orgasm. And it's not even a perverted thing. It's just literally I see the word org and I'm like, orgasm! <laughs> That's the word that comes to mind. Orgasms are on top of organisms. Or you can orgasm on top of organisms, I suppose. <clears throat> but I almost just said orgasm. <laughs> Organism hype, exactly. <clears throat> As a family's guest expert on the care and feeding of primitive organisms, it was Victor who had to show them how to thaw out a little of the frozen cat milk substitute Narina had made for them, and how to hold a bottle so the kitten could drink out of it. She'll be eating solid food soon, he promised. Then she won't be so much trouble. Meanwhile, what have you done about a cat box? But then he had to explain what a cat box was for, and help them improvise one out of a tray from a cooking room, and fill it with soil from the garden, and show them how to put the little animal in it, and stroke her and encourage her until she finally did what she was put there to do. At least he was useful for something, Victor thought. After a final glass of wine, Fred escorted him to their guest room. It was not actually a guest room, Fred explained, showing Victor where the sanitary facilities were and the drawers to store his clothes. It's going to be Belit's room, now that he's liberated. But of course, he's happy to have you use it for your stay, Fred added hastily. I don't like to put him out, Victor said politely. You aren't putting anyone out. No, we want you here, dear Victor. In fact, it was Belit's idea. He'll stay in his own old room, where he's quite content. But this one you see, Frit added with pride, is an adult room. You'll have your own desk. You can use it as much as you like, of course. I think you'll be quite comfortable. He finished looking around while any hostess... Or like any hostess, excuse me. Then he grinned a little embarrassed. Well, I don't see any harm in telling you. We're going to be redecorating Belit's old room. We've ordered another baby from Nina. She'll be a little girl. We're going to call her Jinja. And of course, she won't be born for a long time yet, so Belit will be quite all right in that room. 
It wasn't until Frit was long gone and Victor had undressed and climbed into the soft, warm bed that it occurred to him that he should have said congratulations. <laughs> We're going to build another one! Congrats! Does it come in the pots? Is it in a box? You've got to put it together. we got a long list of games that crash VLC when they are started. No, no need to ban all of them as well. Well, that's crashing VLC. I'm pretty certain Dragonite is using a, a web browser. I don't think he's using VLC. I think he's literally using a web browser, which means if Star Citizen shuts off, pauses, or otherwise disrupts outside sources of entertainment while you're playing it, that's an egomaniac right there. I forgot the exact time that passed for humans. 4,000 years. Um, it says that Victor's 4,000 years are old. I think the full time frame is 4,400. Because he's like he was like 30 when he started out, and now he's like... Um, when the first, after the like the first time he was frozen, after landing on New Man Home, he was like thirty or forty. Um, then he was frozen for four hundred years, and then he lived for like probably less than a year on the frozen New Man Home before he was frozen again for like four thousand years. So that's, you know, that's a thing. We'll never be banning that game. <laughs> no way, dude. But I hate Star Citizen. Buy spaceships that don't exist for real money. Here's one for a thousand dollars. Look, we've gotten three times of the budget, three times the budget of any major film or any game ever made, or every game made between 1981 and 2003, and we still have produced nothing. <laughs> yeah, no. Here's a tech demo. I'm good with that. Where were they? I don't remember. <laughs> ah. The ground shook again that night. Victor woke, startled to find something warm and soft near his toes, and mewed in protest when he mo moved. He got up, grinning, and stroked the kitten back to sleep as he sat on the edge of the bed, thinking. Alone in the bedroom, Victor admitted to himself that he was a little uncomfortable. He knew why. It wasn't really easy in his mind to be moving into a house of gays. Victor was quite certain that he was not at all prejudiced against homosexuals. He'd known plenty of them, one time or another. He'd worked with them, shipped with them. They weren't any different than, than anybody else, he considered, except in that one particular way. But that way wasn't anyone's business but their own, and certainly it didn't matter in any real sense as long as you didn't get involved with them. The trouble was, living with them seemed to be getting pretty involved. It reassured Victor that the household didn't seem much different than any other. Porter and Frit had their own bedroom, Belit had his, Victor had the one Belit would graduate into. Nothing was, well, bizarre about the household, not really. If Forda would sometimes kiss the back of Frit's neck as he passed behind his chair, and if Frit would slip an arm around Forda's waist while they stood together, well, they did love each other, didn't they? What was the most important... Excuse me. What was most important, neither of them showed any indication of all at all of loving Victor. Not that way, anyway. The boy, Belit, almost did. He certainly acted loving, but there wasn't anything sexual about it. Belit sat next to Victor when they ate their meals and kept Victor company while he fruitlessly hunted for what he never found on the information machines. It was Belit who marked which foods and drinks Victor seemed to enjoy, and made sure there were more of them at the next meal. He always seemed to be there, watching Victor whenever he was not to sleep or at school. He's a kid, he stares, that's what they do! <laughs> Except they produced something and they didn't sell individual spaceships for a thousand dollars. No, I think the, the highest price one was like... It was pretty high, I think there was one for like a hundred bucks? A hundred dollars for a single spaceship in the game, no thank you. Well, that doesn't really matter, since 10 to the 40 years pass for 1, 2, the conversion factor comes down to 7 times 10 to the 37, negative 37, excuse me. Which exceeds the online time dilation calculation capabilities. They were definitely faster than 99.9999C, which is where the calculator just wraps to 0. I forgot the 1, 2 factor. Gotta give him the 1, 2 punch. Lol. It's a kind of hero worship, Forder explained. The dancer was working at his bar, stretching those long, slim legs even longer, with one eye on the kitten waking on the floor between them. Victor realized with surprise that Forder was being a cat. This will work, I think, Forda said with pleasure, giving it up as the kitten curled up to drowse again. What were we saying? Oh yes, please don't let Belit bother you. But the thing is, you were the one who actually carried him away from his freeing ceremony. That's a big thing for a young boy. He's no trouble at all, Victor protested. I like having him around. Well, it's obvious he likes you, Forta sighed. I mean, he likes you as a person, not just because of what you did. As a matter of fact, Forta hesitated and smiled. Actually, Belit wondered if he could ask you to come to his school, if you wouldn't mind. He'd like to show you off. I know it wouldn't be much fun for you, spending an hour or two with a bunch of little kids staring and asking. 
you all kinds of questions, but you can't blame them, Victor. You were born on Old Earth. They aren't likely to see anybody like you again. I'd be glad to, Victor promised. I'm concerned. I smell burning. Not bad burning, like fire. Or, like, you know, that kitchen's on fire, or the guy below me lit his bedroom on fire. But I smell, like, barbecue? Hmm. I should, it's a problem. Because I'm in a closed room. I should not be smelling barbecue. No, they don't. Go look at the figures. Cost 250 million for GTA 5. There is 150 million. Nice try, though. Blech. I don't care. Don't like Star Citizen. You can keep touting it all you want. Elite Dangerous was cheaper, faster, better. Gave me all the ships I wanted. All I have to do is earn them in-game. And, da-da-da-da, I can play it now. <laughs> I'm turning on my fan because I'm warm. The school was no more than a hundred yards from a elite's home in the middle of a grove of broad leaf trees hung with fruit and blossoms interchangeably. There weren't any seasons on Moon Mary. Plants grew and bloomed when they felt like it, not when the weather changed. The weather never changed. Red Nergal hung in the eastern sky, where it always hung in their position on Moon Mary's surface. At their distance it loomed no, long, no larger than Earth's moon, but Victor could feel the heat from it, and in the west was one bright star. These would be thousands and thousands of stars, Victor told the boy, who nodded in solemn appreciation. Things must have been so much nicer then, he sighed. We go in there, Victor. That's the door to my class. It wasn't much of a door. Moon Mary's buildings did not have very strong walls, since they didn't need them to keep out cold or heat. It was light, pierced wood, as might have been in Earth's old tropics, and it opened to Belit's touch. It wasn't much of a class, either. Eight kids, mostly girls, and it seemed didn't seem to be exactly a classroom. It looked rather like the guest lounge of a small motel at first. A bedroom-sized chamber with, a, with hassocks and couches strewn before a collection of child-sized teaching desks. But as Belit led Victor into the room, in the room darkening, excuse me. And I paid, <laughs> and I paid 50 euros, or yeah, euros to get you that Cobra Mark 4 KV, so again, moot point. <laughs> no, you paid it for an expansion, which I don't think should have been that expensive, by the way. Which came with a bonus of a Mark IV. You didn't just pay for a boat. You didn't pay, like... My point is, is that Star Citizen ships take money. Like, other games are like, hey, you want a hat? Give us a, you know, give us $2. Star Citizen's, hey, you want a spaceship? Give us 50 bucks. And you're like, dude, no, I'd rather go buy a different game. <laughs> we'll have to wait a minute, Billy, to apologize. They're starting a viewing. I don't know what it is, though. And then all around the children, a scene sprang into life. Three-dimensional, seeming, natural size, full color. Oh, look, Victor. They're doing it specially for you. They're showing old Earth. Though they had $1,200 ships, there were the few capital ships they have. Yeah, $1,200. If I'm going to drop $1,200, it is not going to be on one spaceship inside of an unfinished video game. At the time. I don't care where it's at now. <laughs> If it was really Earth, it was not an Earth Victor recognized. He seemed to be standing on a sort of traffic island in the middle of a large street, and it was by no means empty. Thousands, literally thousands, of people were riding bicycles towards him in a dense swarm that split, that spilt in two just... Spilt? It's supposed to be split, but he spelled it spilt. <laughs> it's S-P-I-L-T, but it's supposed to be S-P-L-I-T. That split in two just before they reached him. And came together again on the other side. They tore across. They wore almost uniform costumes: white shirts, dark blue trousers, and they were almost all male and Oriental. There was no sound, but to one side was a huge marble building set in a sort of park, and on the other, what looked like a hotel and office buildings. I don't know where this is supposed to be. Victor apologized. Billy really looked embarrassed, but they said it was Earth. He complained. Wait a minute. He bent to whisper to the little girl nearest him. Yes, this is Earth, all right. It is a place called Beijing, around the year 1960. Old style. I was never in Beijing, Victor said. And anyway, he stopped there. What was the use of telling these children that they were not off by a mere few thousand miles, but by several centuries? He settled for, it's very nice, though. But can we turn it off? When Victor ha had the floor, the teacher sat there smiling, leaving it all to the children to ask questions. And that they did. About old earth, people rode horses? If they made love, did they really have babies out of their bodies? And what, for heaven's sake, was a storm? About the Sorokane Tiga objects. Oh, they must have been exciting to see. And about his near death in orbit around Nibu. Something tried to kill you? Really take away your life? And about New Manhome and the Big Bang and the reasons why there were so few stars anymore anywhere in the sky. 
That was where Victor began to wax really eloquent, until Belit, speaking for all of them, said gravely, Yes, we see, Victor. The stars that blew up, the sun going dim, the changes on Nebu, the disappearance of all the other stars, we see that, as they all happen at the same time, or close enough. They must be connected, but how? And all Victor could say was, I wish I knew. <laughs> hmm? They didn't do all the expensive ones included other stuff as well? Unless it, unless it included 40 or 50 copies of the game, no. <laughs> if I'm going to pay $1,200 on a digital object, that then that company had best send me a highly detailed model of that object that is no less than two feet long. <laughs> With <a> blinking LEDs! <laughs> in a sense, they were lucky the universe was, go was gone when they turned back, otherwise the light in front of them would have turned first into x-rays and then into gamma rays. True. They may have had they may have had babies out of their bodies. Exactly. That night, Belit was telling his parents excitedly about the hit Victor had made with his classmates. Victor was almost killed by those things on Nebu. The boy said, thrilled. Frit, can I get to Nebu sometime? What and get killed? Frit teased. <laughs> Ford was stretching and bending at his bar as he panted. No one goes to Nebu, Belit dear. It's worse than New Man Home. You couldn't even stand up there. Ellie can. The boy objected. He gets injections, and then he's almost as strong as Victor. Frit looked shocked. Belit, no! Those injections destroy your figure. Do you want to bloat those pretty legs so they look like balloons? No offense, he added hastily, catching Victor's eye. But Belit, you couldn't ever really dance that way, you know. I might not want to be a dancer, Frit, his son told him. Forta straightened up abruptly in the middle of a long stretch. He blinked wordly at his son. Well, of course, he began. What you do in your adult life is entirely up to you. Neither Frit nor I would think to try to, to prevent you from anything you really wanted to do once you were grown. But I am grown, Billy told him seriously. It's almost time for me to have the mark of off my forehead. Then I could even marry if I wanted to. Frit cleared his throat. Yes, of course, he said, tugging at one of his mustaches. However, he paused there, looking at Victor in a way Victor understood at once. A guest must not involve himself in family affairs. I think I'll go back to my desk, he said. But what he wanted was not there. Victor began to think that nothing he found was going to scratch his itch of curiosity. The more he found, the more he realized there was not much to find on the subjects he cared about. There was plenty in the files on the history of the human race after the reforms had put, back, put him back in the freezer. They had had a war about the destruction of Ark, of course. Each, bl each sect blamed the others. They had, as Victor counted them up, a war every two or three years anyway, on one pretext or another. It was easy enough to see why they were so com combative. Victor could imagine the lives of the bare few thousands of them near starving in the icy caves, wounded by events that they had never expected and that they could not explain. There was no future for them. Of all the things they lacked, the one and shortest supply was hope. It was astonishing to Victor that they had somehow found the resources and the will to dispatch a handful of rickety improvised ships to Nergal. That was heroic. It was very nearly superhuman. It meant long years of savage discipline, starving themselves and denying themselves for that one last supreme effort. He marveled at their progress since then, now so many teeming millions living in such luxury. It wasn't the numbers that made him wonder, of course. The increase was not surprising, since they'd had several thousand years to do it in. You only have to double a population ten times. Ten generations will do it easily, if there's plenty of food and no saber-toothed tigers to keep the surplus down to multiply it by a thousand. Nor was it surprising that in the course of that mighty effort they threw some unseated, unneeded junk overboard, junk with names like astronomy and astrophysics and cosmology. And the descendants, the soft, pretty Nuinas and Fortas and Fritz, had never seen any reason to revive them. Except for little Balit. Balit wanted to hear everything Victor had to say about the universe itself, especially about the way it had been in the old days, when there really was a whole universe outside their own little group about old Earth, about New Manhome and the days of the burgeoning glory. It was Belit who came to Victor with the news that Pelly had landed on New Manhome. Maybe he can help you access the old files, Victor, Belit said helpfully, glancing at his father, who for some reason was were politely saying nothing at all. Could he really do that? We can call him to ask, Belit said, now not looking at his father's at all. I know how much you want to get that data. Ford cleared his throat. Yes, we all know that, he observed. But it would be interesting to me, too, Belit protested. I like it when Victor talks about these old things. Fortis said, loving but firm, It's your bedtime, Belit. Then Victor could could tell me a bedtime story, Belit pleaded. Victor surrendered. He followed the boy to his bath and sat with him. As damply clean, Belit rolled himself into the soft, gauzy bedcloth and looked up at him expectantly. <laughs> you just bought a new tape plug-in? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> 
I'm pretty sure I've thrown 400 euros at FDev for Elite with all the skins and copies of the games I bought so far. No regrets. Well, as long as you're happy with your purchase, that's fine. I would never buy in two Star Citizen. But that's just me. I will admit that I expected it to fail long before now. I expected someone up in the top ranks to abscond with all the money. That has yet to happen, so something's going on. I mean, they're building a game. It's just taking a lot longer, and they're asking for a lot more money than I'm willing to wait or give. <laughs> ah, anyway, where was I? Victor found himself moved by the situation. So familiar, so different. It made him think of telling stories to his own children long ago on New Manholm. And before that, hearing his father tell them to him, tell, uh, tell them to him ages past in the machine. Excuse me, in the ship. I'm losing it here. He reached out to stroke Belit's warm, fuzzy head. Shall I tell you about the beginning of the universe, he asked. Oh yes, Victor, please. Obediently, Victor began. Once upon a time, there was nothing. Not anything anywhere. Except for one little point of matter and energy in space. There weren't any stars. There weren't any galaxies. There wasn't even any space yet, really, because space hadn't been invented. What did that point look like, Victor? The boy asked drowsily. I don't know. Nobody knows, Belit. It was just a sort of... Okay, so it says it was just a point or a something. It's rubbed off here. I can't read it. Sort of that held inside itself the possibility of everything that now exists. Or ever did exist. Or ever will exist. And then that egg hatched. Oh, I guess he said egg. <laughs> it exploded. Do you know what that explosion was called, Belit? The boy searched his memory. What you called the Big Bang, he guessed? That's right. The Big Bang. It started out terribly hot and terribly dense. And as it expanded, it cooled off. It didn't grow into space. It made space. And as it grew, and it filled it with things, and finally we came along. Belit blinked up at Victor. Were we the only ones who came along, Victor, he asked. I don't know the answer to that either, Belit. I haven't heard of any others. There could have been. There might have been millions of different kinds of people. They could have evolved and developed and then died away, just as human beings did. Except for us few. It must have been beautiful when there, when there were all those stars and galaxies. It was, but stars die too. All things die, even the universe. Even, to Victor's surprise, he found his throat tightening. He had to turn his head away for a moment. What's wrong, Victor? Belit said in a sudden alarm. Nothing, Belit. I think you'd better go to sleep now. No, the boy insisted. He looked very sad just then. Was it about something bad? Was it? He hesitated. Then he said in a rush, Was it about the love partner you told me about? It was about my wife, Victor corrected him. Belit nodded so soberly. I know how Fritt and Forda would feel if one of them lost the other, he told Victor. He looked at him for a moment, then said, sounding very ten tentative, Victor, didn't Narina say she could make you a mate? Don't you think you might let her? Victor glared at him with a sudden near anger. Then he relaxed, took a deep breath, and tousled the boy's hair. You're officially grown up, he said, but I think you've got a little way to go in some ways. That isn't how it works, Belit. Then how does it work, Victor? Belit persisted. Victor shook his head. For me, now, he said. I don't think it's ever going to work again at all. Ah, I'm old, and you guys don't have any of those tiny blue pills I like. Ah! <laughs> ah, who put these stairs here? Hmm. With all the money they had thrown at them at the beginning, they only had two options anyway, grab and run, or to make the best game ever. They didn't run, so better be the best game ever. <laughs> yeah, if it becomes the best game ever, I'm all over it. Because I liked Wing Commander. I did. I would still play um, Wing Commander Privateer, but all those games are really old, and although the technology was good at the time, they're kind of crappy to play now, for me, anyway. There are much better space games, even from that era, that controlled better, play better, look better. But their stories were good, and if they pull that through to the, this version, that's great. But that's it, it, right now. There's not enough to ask to like forgive them my money. Even if you do the math, eight hundred is still a lot of money. Eight hundred dollars is a lot of money. Eight hundred is like rent, you know. Anyway, the mechanics of calling someone a new man home were not that difficult, especially after Bleach showed Victor how to use the desk to do it. Actually, making the call, however, was a lot harder. Once again, it was a matter of that unbreakable speed limit of light's velocity. The human race had never managed to use Tachyon's or einstein rosen Podolsky effect for any p practical purpose. With only their own tiny little cluster of astronomical objects to work on, they hadn't really needed to. At their current orbital positions, Moon Mary was a good 500 million miles from New Manhome, nearly three quarters of an hour each way for a message to arrive. You couldn't converse. It was more like sending a telegram and waiting for a response. Though, of course, the telegram was a television message. So Victor, with Belit beside him to help, put through a call to Pelly, all those hundreds of millions of miles away. Hello, Pelly, he said, as though reading from a script. This is Victor. I was hoping... He came to a stop there and looked to Belit for help. Tell him what you want, the boy prompted. 
Everything I want? Yes, exactly everything, the boy ordered, sounding exasperated. How will he know if you don't tell him? Tell him you would like all the old records, about Nibu, about astronomical observations, everything you wish. So, gathering speed as he went along, Victor did. It made a formidable list. When he was through, Belite leaned past him and turned the desk off. Victor looked at him inquiringly. What do we do now? We do nothing now, Belite told him. It will be hours at least before Pelly can reply, and perhaps he is busy doing something else. And perhaps what you ask takes time. I imagine it will, Victor said gloomily. Belite laughed. Oh, Victor, he said with affection. It is only hours, perhaps not forever. Come and walk with me. Perhaps when we get back there will be a response. When they had taken that belly-twisting elevator drop down to the park-like grounds around the building, Belit said curiously, Would you really go to Nibu if you could? In a hot minute, Victor said emphatically. Even though it's dangerous? Victor thought. I'm not sure it's dangerous anymore, he said. They did let the party land. But then some of them were killed. Yes, because they tried to force their way in, Victor agreed. That might not be necessary. There are other ways of investigating that's not what's in those structures. Not x-rays, probably, but ultrasound rangings, perhaps, or something like a neutrino source that can look right through them. No one has any neutrinos, Victor, Belit said in reproof. Victor laughed. All right, then. Maybe we'll re we'll, bleh, maybe all we would really need is a really big can opener and some dumb volunteer to run run it. Like me. Belit shuddered deliciously at the thought. Then he asked, Victor, what's a can opener? It's that thing that spreads your mom's legs! <laughs> uh. Mm. Go look a star. I threw $30 in at them during a sale for a small ship. Maybe I'll get it used someday. Otherwise, it's two times eating out that I have to skip. Shrugs. <laughs> Fair enough. Or that's one order of pizza. Let's be honest here. Before development is finished, you will get a copy thrown at you from one of us. <laughs> You know, if someone throws me a copy of Star Citizen, I would try it, because that's how I am, but I can't promise that I'd like it. And that's the one thing I always say when you guys donate a game. I can never, I can never promise that I'll like the game. They're most games I like. If I can't, if, if I can't play them, I'd usually try not to blame the game. It's my failing, not yours. But, uh, more often than not, I tend to get bored. You know? <sighs> I think Fallout gave a lot of stuff that was worth it, other games I cannot say. Did KB just say pizza? I did, out loud, with food. Pizza's expensive. Brewery City Pizza is like 40 bucks. Anyway, where was I? Can opener. Right. There wasn't any answer to Victor's call when they got back, or the next day, or the day after that. By the end of his third week on Moon Mary, Victor had begun to wonder just how long a guest was supposed to stay. When he touched on the subject with his host, they were invariably hospitable and invariably hard to pin down. Oh, but Belit loves having you here, Victor, and Fort has been dying to have you show him some more of those quaint old dances. And it's so good for your leg to heal here, Forda put in, hopefully. Helpfully, excuse me. But Narina, he began. Oh, Narina, Fritz said, affably dismissing Narina. She'll be in touch before long, Victor, you'll see. That reminds me, I've been meaning to ask you something. Do you think those Nibu colors, the ones you showed me, showed us the other day, do you think they would make a good costume for Forta? And then that strutting, the waltz and the Peabody to be worked into a dance, Forta was planning on the heroic subject of the disastrous landing on Nibu. Sorry. Lily, I had to pick up Lily because she's being all muley at me. Because it's noon and she thinks noon is 2 o'clock because she thinks if she comes in and meows, meowing means food. Mm, meowing does not mean food. You know what meowing means? You're annoying and I pet you. <laughs> That's all meowing means. Meow, 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 meow. There you go, have a pet. You can jump up on the desk. But you're not getting into this or I'll kick your ass. <laughs> That's not for you. It was not merely Victor's desire to be a good guest that was to say one I who left like before. To be her. Immortalized Hello? as my friend. Joseph Remy is boarded the show bus. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you for the follow. And Ethan Parker, apparently. But I think Ethan was from yesterday. What is this thing you call a can opener? <laughs> It was not merely Victor's desire to be a good guest. That was to say, one who left before his host began to despair he would ever go. That made him begin to be uncomfortable. He also had another problem that was growing larger. Moon Mary was a big place. It was full of people. All kinds of people. And Victor could not help noticing that some of the ones he passed in the parks and streets were female. Were so conspicuously female to all of his senses that sometimes he almost thought they were scent marking the shrubbery. It distracted him in ways he had almost forgotten. To put it more correctly, he was getting pretty horny. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, concretely. But still. <laughs> oh, Frederick, you so cray cray. Uh, how far are we from the end? Oh, we got some time. I don't think we're going to be able to finish today, guys. I had hoped, but there's not many dead pages. There's literally only two dead pages at the end of the book, so there's a large chunk here we will probably not get through before I have to end today, but we'll try. When Belly's answer came at last, it wasn't very helpful. The broad pumpkin face looked a little annoyed. I'll ask around about what you want to know, Victor, but I don't know much about the sort of thing myself. Markety might know. He spends a lot of time digging up old stuff, and so does his wife, Grimler. Unfortunately, they're not here now, and I'm leaving myself pretty soon. Listen. While I think of it, if you see Narina, ask her how she's coming with my gillies. They seem more... They need some more here, and say hello to Bleat for me. That was it. Victor looked helplessly at Bleat. Who are Markety and Grimler? I guess they're people who live on New Manholm. I mean, real people. Well, you know what I mean, Victor. He finished half apologizing. Then he thought for a moment and added, I think Markety studied with Forta for a while when I was little. Do you mean he's a dancer? What would a dancer be doing on New Manholm? Elite Grant, dancing, I guess. Don't you think you should give Nerina her message? Oh, well, Victor is smiling. Yes, maybe. But in the long run, he did, hesitantly. He had always thought that Nerina should be the one to call him, but when he saw her lean, wide-eyed face looking up at him out of the desk panel, he was unexpectedly happy. Conscious of the boy beside him, Victor said stiffly, How are you, Narina? I've missed you. It was a downer that she didn't respond right away. She was gazing up at him without speaking for several seconds, but just as Victor was beginning to feel insecure, she spoke up. That is good to hear, she said, smiling. Of course, distance again, only a matter of seconds this time, because Narina's habitat was less than a million miles from the moon Mary, but that was something like five seconds travel time each way. Quite long enough to be disconcerting. She did, Victor thought, still seem affectionate. He gave her Pelly's message, and Rena thought for a second. The gillies are young, she said doubtfully. I was going to send them for another couple of seasons. Excuse me, I wasn't going to send them for another couple of seasons. Still, How would you like they might to be dear. immortalized as my friend. Now playing too, his brother the short bus. Welcome, friend. <laughs> still, it might be better for them to finish growing up where they're going to live. These are special gillies, you know. They're almost as strong as the original gorillas you talk about, it, I think. But a lot more tra tractable. Like you. She finished with an affectionate grin. Oh, and I'm not too happy with the DNA from the stiffs I've still got. If you talk to Pelly, tell him to bring me some more. No. She corrected herself. I might as well call him myself. Well, it's been nice talking to you. Belit, is that you? How are you doing with your genetic studies? All right, I guess, Aunt Narina, the boy piped up. Of course, I haven't had much time helping Victor and all. I believe that, she agreed ruefully. He does take a lot of time, doesn't he? But he's worth it. And she blew them both a kiss and was gone. And she hadn't said a word about his coming back to her. Because she does not truly love you, Victor. You are nothing more than a tool for her. And your tool is a tool. You're a tool's tool. Go bang something. Feel better. Then go to new man home. Are you happy? Ah! The coffee's good today. <laughs> Where was I? Actually, where the hell was I? Oh, there, right there I am. <laughs> nor did she in the days that followed, nor did Pelly call back. When Victor grumbled to believe, the boy said, He's probably on his way home now, Victor, but I'm sure he got your message to those other people. Then why don't they answer, Victor demanded. The boy shrugged, and Victor's temper rose. I could understand it if, I w if it was all lost. It's wonderful that it hasn't been lost, but you tell me they've had power all along, and geothermal generators have kept right on working, and the data's there. Only nobody ever wants to look at it. Please don't get excited, Victor pleaded. I can't help it. Doesn't anybody care? I care, Victor. Really, though, you should be more calm. Billy hesitated, then said with determination, Do you know what I think, Victor? I think you are building up too many tensions. Victor gave him a hostile look. What tensions are you talking about? Billy's expression seemed to show he was sorry he'd brought the subject up, but he took the plunge. Why don't you have a sexual partner, Victor? He asked with determination. Victor flushed. He was taken aback. I, he said, I, uh... He was having trouble responding. The last thing he had expected was to have, a, this, to have to discuss his sex life with this child. He managed to get it out. Well, if I did, it wouldn't be a safe for the woman. Because you are potent, yes, of course, Billy agreed earnestly. That can be fixed, just as it was for me. In a few days, the rest of my residual sperm will be resorbed and my brand removed, and then I can have sexual intercourse freely again, just as you could. Wait a minute, Victor said, staring at the boy. Again? 
Billy looked puzzled. Then he said in a self-deprecating way, Of course, before I was mature, it was only with young girls. For practice, as we say, though I did enjoy it very much. Soon it will be with real women. It can be for you too, Victor, if you want it. It doesn't hurt a bit, he added encouragingly. Well, except for a little bit, right at the first. You know, you don't have to have a wife. You don't have to agree to pairing right at first. Hardly anybody does that. So it seems, Victor growled, thinking of Narina. The boy's puzzled look returned, but he just asked curiously, Have you ever done that, Victor? Paired, I mean. Sure I have, Victor replied. Then more slowly he said, I was married for a long time. Her name was Risa. Teresa McGann. But she's dead now. Fascinated, Billy went on. And did you and this Risa, Teresa McGann, have actual children together? I mean, born out of her body? Yes, we did, Victor said shortly. His discomfort was growing. It was not often that he thought of those long dust members of his family, and it felt as though thinking of them now was likely to begin to hurt. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, just being a tool's tool, KV. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with being a tool's tool. And did you love her? Billy demanded. Victor looked at the boy. Yes, he shouted and realized again, quite a lot too late, that it was very true. <laughs> it's only been 4,000 years, Victor. It's fine. Time passed slowly for, for Victor. He spent a lot of time in his room waiting for the message from New Man Home that might answer all his questions, but it never came. There was no point in calling Pelly again, because the space captain was well on his way back to Nergal. Victor hesitated about trying Marchetti, or Grimler, whoever they were. But finally, impatience went over hesitation, and he placed a call to each of them. There were no answers to those, either. Belit counseled patience. Belit himself was always patient with Victor, when Victor was, Victor was gloomy or stormy, but Victor's patience was running out. He spent more and more time with his desk, searching out every scrap of information he could find that bore at all on anything astronomical. None of it was any help. There's plenty of data to be sure on the universe as it was, nothing on how it came to be that way. For a while, Victor interested himself in the Atlas of the Skies. There wasn't much of it. Their own planets, just as he had known them in the first years of New Man Home, the habitats, Nergal itself. Their paltry group of surrounding stars had been studied after a fashion long enough to give them names, not much more. There was one group of four stars, usually called the Quadrangle. Their names were Sapphire, Gold, Steel, and Blood taken, Victor supposed, from the way they looked in the sky. There was solitary, all off by itself, and it's part of the, it's part of the sky. A natural enough name. There were the binary pair, now called mother and father, with a period of about 800 years. There was neighbor, the nearest star at less than three light years distance, but an uninspiring little K-8. Then there was milk. Victor studied the pale glow of milk carefully, because it was the corpse of one of the stars that had flared in its own long-ago skies. The desk could tell him little, for no one lately had seemed to care why stars were different in color, and certainly no one had thought much about stellar evolution, but Victor was nearly sure that what they saw wasn't the star itself anymore, but the shell of expanding gas it had thrust out of itself, now lit from within. Then he discovered that someone, sometime in the past, had taken the trouble to look a little more closely at all those stars, and had found that gold had six detectable planets. Planets! And yellow gold was G4, close enough to their own stellar type. Indeed to the type of Earth's own sun. Was it possible that someone had lived on one of the gold's planets? See? This is Victor's problem. He's screaming and moaning and complaining and throwing rocks, asking people, oh, by the love of God, what happened to the universe? And now he's like, ooh, planet star! Let's go there! He's got the space equivalent of ADD. <laughs> Why is it whenever something cool happens to me, it's always some kind of madness? Anyway. By the time he could talk to Belit again, he was bubbling with excitement. It all fits together, Belit, he cried. There's a planetary system not very distant at all. Suppose there's life on one of those planets, Belit. You mean people like us, Belit asked, wide-eyed. I don't know about that, Belit. Probably not very much like us, if you mean two arms, two legs, two eyes, and I don't know any idea... Excuse me, I don't have any idea what they look like. But like us in that they've developed intelligence and technology. Why not? That might even be a little further along in science and technology than the human race ever was. It wouldn't have to be very far to make a big difference. With spaceships, you mean? Exactly, with interstellar spaceships. Suppose these golden aliens for purposes of their own, and how could we ever guess what their purposes might be? Suppose they decided to move a little furniture around. A dozen stars or so, for instance. Suppose they sent a crew to Nebu to build the machines that would take the energies of our sun and use them to propel these few stars at high speed across the universe. Don't you see, Belit? It explains everything! And if we study the things on Nebu very carefully, we might know how to do things like that ourselves? Or at least know why? Exactly! Victor cried in triumph. Well, 
he got the basic idea down. Somebody else out there did change the universe. It just wasn't those guys over there. But the triumph didn't last. For a guess was only a guess, and there was no way to test his hypothesis. He spent more and more time in his room, fruitlessly going over the data, wishing for word from New Manholm. He was gazing at the pale point of light that was either that was the star gold, and Frit tapped on the door. He was carrying the kitten, and he had an apologetic look. Belit forgot to feed her, and now he's in bed, Frit said. Can you help? Sure, Victor said. Not very graciously. The kitten was big enough to eat regular food now. I'll come out. You don't have to carry her, he added. Put her down. If she's hungry, she'll follow us. Frit politely set the cat on the floor and led the way. To Victor's surprise, Forda was in the kitchen. That was the only way Victor could think of the room, shipping, sipping a glass of wine and looking expectant. Victor found the little container of scraps of food, opened it, and set it on the floor. The kitten strolled over, sniffed at it, and then looked up at him. He smiled. She's just being polite, he said. That's what she wanted. See, she's eating now. As he turned to leave, Forda said, Why don't you have a glass of wine with us, Victor? Victor perceived that it wasn't just a casual invitation. He sat down and let Forda fill her glass for him before he said, You didn't really need to feed the cat, did you? Victor dimpled. Not really. We wanted to talk to you after Belit was asleep. Faint alarm bells sounded in Victor's head. Is something wrong, he asked. No, not really wrong, Victor, Frit said honestly. It's just that we're a little bit concerned about Belit. About Belit's future, Forta amplified. Frit nodded. We've always hoped he would want to become an artist of some sort, a dancer, perhaps, like Forta. He wouldn't have to be a dancer, as long as it was something that used his creative ability. Nuina thinks he has a real talent as a gene worker, Forta added. That's a kind of art, too, of course. But lately he's been so, well, so excited about these stars and things of yours, Victor, Frit finished. Victor took a sip of his wine, feeling the strain between the obligations of a good guest and that burning need to know. Belit's a very intelligent boy. He's really interested in science, too, Victor said. I think he could be good at it. Yes, we're sure he could, Victor, Forda said reasonably. But what kind of life would Belit have if he confined his talents to science? Nobody's a scientist. People will think he's odd. <laughs> hey, it's just like today! ED is fun, though, but I don't like not being able to get out of my ship. I love not being able to get out of my ship. I played X. I hated getting out of my ship. I hate any game where you have to get out of your ship to, to walk into a base, to talk to somebody, to turn around and walk back into your ship. I'd really just pull them up on the comms. Jim! Jim, are you there? Answer the phone! What? I need a mission! Go to Mars. Got it! I'm out! I don't have to walk three blocks for that crap. We invented the telephone for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Where was I? Oh, right, yelling. In my time, it was highly honored profession, Victor said defensively, and he thought not entirely truthfully, for it depended on which time he was talking about. Certainly, the icy new man home of the four warring sects had offered few honors to scientists. In your time, Porter repeated. His tone wasn't exactly disdainful, but the best he could say was that it was forgiving. Anyway, Victor... It's not creative, is it? There's nothing new for him to do. You said yourself, all this sort of science thing was well known thousands and thousands of years ago. Not all of it, no. No one really understood what happened to all to our stars. Even the parts that were understood then, the basic astrophysics and cosmology, nobody seemed to know anything about them now. They need to be rediscovered. Fred said earnestly, But don't you see the difference? Rediscovery, Victor dear, is not the same as creation, is it? You can't blame us for wanting something grander for our boy. Oh, Frit, Victor said, despairing. How can I make you understand? What could be grander than answering the question of what happened to the entire universe? Maybe Belit can discover that. He's interested. He's smart. He simply doesn't have the education. First, he needs a grasp of cosmology and nuclear decay, and no one knows those things anymore, Victor. Truly. They simply aren't interesting to us. But they must be on record somewhere, Victor said, clutching his straws. I know the databanks in Ark and Mayflower had all that material. They don't exist anymore, Victor. What was left of them must have been salvaged for structural materials thousands of years ago. But they were copied onto the files on New Manholm. Frit gave Forta a meaningful look. Yes, New Manholm, he said. Forta sighed. For some reason, the thought of the files on New Manholm seemed to make him uncomfortable. Well, he said, we'll see what we can do. I hope I can repay you, Victor said. Forta gave him a strange look. That's all right, he said, sounding insincere. Then, do you know a, a lot of stories like the Big Bang ones you were telling Belit? Oh, dozens, Victor told him, aware for the first time that the parents had been listening in. In fact, he did. In fact, he had all the stories his father had told him still well in mind. 
the story of the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen cycle that fueled the stars, the story of the death of massive stars and supernova, and the birth of pulsars and black holes, the stories of Kepler's law, of motion, and of Newton's, and of Einstein's sur superseding laws, and of the rules of quantum mechanics that went beyond even Einstein. Yes, of course, Fortis said, yawning. Those are very interesting. I know Billy loves to hear about them. But not all the time, please, Victor Frit finished, if you don't mind. <laughs> If he doesn't like walking about because he's lazy and doesn't want to get up from his comfy chair, he might actually have to <laughs> might actually have grown to it by now. I stand up sometimes. I move from here to work and from work to other places. I did sit-ups the other day. My stomach is still very bubbly, but I did uh, sit-ups the other day. I've been attempting to exercise. I am fat. <laughs> and that's okay. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. I sleep all night and I work all day. He's on. Mm, sorry, I was singing. Then the long awaited transmission came in from New Manholm, and it was not at all what Victor had expected. To begin with, of course, it wasn't Pelly calling. The space captain had to be halfway back to Nergal by now. The face on the screen was a man wearing a sort of floppy beret, pulled down almost to his eyebrows. He was a habitat person, but he was actually wearing clothes. Victor, he began without preamble. I'm Markety. I'm just here for a short time, but I've managed to collect some of the material for you. Give me, re give my respects to Forta, please. He is one of my heroes, as I am sure he knows. Here's the material. KV, just be fat and proud. Hell yeah. Eagerly, Victor watched the screen on the desk as new pictures began to appear. Puzzledly, he stared at them. After months, he knew what sort of thing the desk produced when interrogated. These were quite different. They were simply a series of, well, photographs. The first batch was pictures of bits and pieces of the machinery. Some of it was the same shiny lavender metal as the keepsake Belit proudly kept by his bedside. Some of the unidentified materials that could have been steel or glass or ceramic. It dawned on Victor that they were the odds and ends that had been salvaged from the surface of the planet Nipu. But there was no explanation for any of them, no hint of what they might be for, or what studies might have been made from them. The next batch was more puzzling still. It had to do with the astrophysics, all right, but it was not data displayed from a computer file. It was pictures, pictures of pages of manuscript, or logbooks, or even a few pages from a book here and there. They seemed to have been taken from the freezers. They were all fragmentary, a couple of pages of something without beginning or ending, and pages themselves as like as not torn or frayed or spotted with illegibility. Some of them made Victor blink. Some of it went so far back that his father's own observations were there. For a while, at least, someone had been faithful at keeping records. Billy Stockbridge, perhaps, loyal to Pal Sorokine to the last. There were spectrograms of the sun as it cooled, of the starburst as it grew, of the dozens of stars that still remained in their sky, dimmer than before, but not swallowed into the starburst. None of them were anything like the spectrograms Pal Sorokine had so doggedly gleaned of the stars that had flared and died all about them. The Sorokine Tiga objects were still unique. None of the spectrograms made any sense to Victor, either. The dead ob the observers had left their own speculations, but none of them was convincing. None of them explained what it was that had stolen most of the stars out of the sky, and they were all so very old that there was nothing at all about the fireball that had dominated the sky for so long. When Belit came back from school, Victor was still puzzling over the transmission. He displayed it all over again for Belit, but repetition didn't make it clearer. Belit didn't do any homework that night. He and Victor ate quickly and returned to the desk. It was the objects from Nibu that seemed most fascinating to the boy. But what can they be, he asked, not for the first time, and not for the first time, Victor shook his head. The only way to find out is to investigate them. Somebody made them, after all, somebody from gold or somewhere else, but still some person. They can be opened up. Belit shivered. People did try, Victor. More than twenty of them were killed. People die for a lot less important reasons, Victor said roughly. Naturally, it would have to be done with a lot of precautions, systematically, the way people used to defuse bombs in wars. What are wars, Victor? Victor refused to be sidetracked. They poured over the material until it was late, and Belit yawning said, I don't know if I understand, Victor. Are our stars the only ones still alive anywhere? That's the way it looks, Belit. The stars live forever, Victor, the boy said drowsily. Not forever. For a we long time. Hmm? Watching you. Victor stopped, remembering a joke. He laughed as he got ready to tell it. There used to be a story about that, Belit. A student is asking his astronomy teacher a question. Pardon me, professor, but when did you say the sun would turn into a red giant and burn us all up? The professor says, in about five billion years. So the student says, oh, thank God, I thought you said five million. But Belit didn't laugh. He was sleeping, and as Victor carried the boy to his bed, he wasn't laughing either. It's not a very funny joke. <laughs> 
Victor sought out the one of excuse me. Victor sought out the one of Belit's parents at home. He found Frit painting something on a large screen. I'm sorry I kept him so late. We got to talking about why all these things had happened. Where you go wrong, Victor, Frit told him serenely, is in always asking why. There doesn't have to be a why. You don't have to understand things. It's enough to feel. Victor looked down comprehendingly at the designs. Frit was painting on the screen. The screen, he saw, was flimsy. It would be transferred to the wall of the room that would some day be Ginger's. It was a wall poem, he laughed. So I shouldn't try to understand why you're doing that, when Ginger isn't even born and won't be able to read for years yet? No, Victor. That is very easy to understand, Frit said indulgently. When Ginger learns to read, I want her first words to come from her father. No, he went on, brushing in another character in a chartreuse flourish and looking critically at the result. It is this obsession of yours for understanding the sky that worries me. It upsets Belit, I'm afraid. What's the use of it? The sky is the sky, Victor. It has nothing to do with our lives. But you've written poems about the sky. Ah, but that is art. I write poems about what people feel about the sky. No one can experience the sky, Victor. One can only look at it and see it as an object of art. He shook his head wooly. Excuse me, he shook his wooly head in reproof. All these things you tell to Belit, hydrogen atoms fusing into helium, suns exploding and dying, there's no feeling there. There's just horrid mechanical things. In spite of himself, Victor was amused. Aren't you even curious? About stars? Not at all. About the human heart, of course. But science, Victor stopped shaking his head. I don't see how you can talk that way, Frit. Don't you want to know things? Don't you want to have Belit understand science? He waved an arm around the future nursery. If it weren't for science, how could you and Forta have a child? Ah, but that's useful science, Victor. That's worth knowing about. Not like you're worrying about whose lines are where and which spectra. It's good because it makes our lives better. But I'm not at all curious about why stars shine and what makes them hot. And least of all about where they're, they've all gone. Because there's nothing anyone can do about it anyway, is there? <clears throat> kind of funny when Paul refers to science that's been refined, improved, or changed since then. Yeah. Well, this is like the, you know, the 80s. <clears throat> By the time word came that Pelly was back in the habitats, Victor was beginning to feel as though he had seriously outstayed his welcome on Moon Mary. Belit was still lawyer, loyal. Frit was unfailingly polite. Forta, at least, had a use for their guests. He borrowed Victor for an hour or so almost every day to dance with him. Forta appreciated it, and for Victor it seemed good exercise for his nearly healed leg. Though Frit did not seem to approve. Victor heard them talking, not quite out of earshot, and Frit was being reasonable. Folk dancing? Oh yes, Forta, dear, but what is a folk dancing, after all? It's simply what primitive people used to do when they didn't have professionals to watch. But you are an artist. And you, Forta said, with him good, told him good-humoredly, are a little jealous, aren't you? Of course not. On the other hand, dear. And the rest of the conversation Victor could not hear, which was probably just as well. Victor was leading Forta through the familiar sweet miserlu when the, the package arrived from Pelly. Victor opened it with excitement, something from Nibu for him to study, something more informative than the broken bits and pieces that, like Belit's keepsake. It was not from Nibu. It was human-made and very old. Ellie's message said, This appears to have come from one of your old ships, Victor. I thought you'd like to listen to it. The last time Victor had seen the object was on Old Ark, just before the fatal attempt at landing a team of investigators. It was, in fact, and it was, in fact, Ark's own black box recording log. It even still worked, more or less. Someone had been repairing it. Somewhere along the line, and much of the material was erased, much more so deteriorated in sound quality that Victor could hardly make it out. But there was one tiny section that was loud and clear, and the voice that was speaking on the log was one Victor knew very well. Jake Lundy. It was the voice of Victor's rival speaking from the grave. When Belit came in an hour later, he found Victor sitting over the log, listening once again to the voice of his long-dead rival. I've now been in the ship for 47, 57 days, it was saying, the voice weak and cracking. I can't hold out much longer. The others are dead, and I guess... That was all that there was that was still intelligible. Belit put his arm around Victor in compassion. He listened to the tape with Victor, and listened again. I know how you feel, Victor, he declared. It must be awful hearing your friend's voice when he's been dead for thousands of years. Victor looked at him without expression. Jake Lundy wasn't a friend, he said. Then why... But Victor could not answer, because he couldn't find words to tell the boy how the voice of Risa's long-dead lover had suddenly started a hopeless longi longing for the long-dead Risa herself. That night, dancing miserlu again with Forta, Victor found himself near to weeping. Is something wrong? Forta asked worriedly. Victor just shook his head and went on with the dance. When Frit came in, looking faintly jealous at the sight of Victor holding Forta, he said, Listen, something's come up. 
I've been talking to Rena. She thinks we should come to visit her. Look at the sketches and talk to her about Jinja. The principal thought in Victor's mind was that he was not, just then, ready to resume his affair with the woman who had brought him back to life. But we're horny, Victor! You need to bangy bangy! <laughs> I'm an adult. Hmm. <clears throat> when they reached Narina's habitat, she was there to greet them. Proudly exclaiming over Belit's now blemishless, for blemishless forehead. No brand! Oh, and you'll be making love first chance you get now, won't you? Of course, Belit said sedately. Then Narina whisked him off to her laboratory, all but Victor. Victor was not involved in the planning of the new baby. He was given the freedom of her quarters to wait for her pleasure instead. It was a long wait. Then when she did arrive, her words were not of love. For the first time in Victor's experience of her, Narina looked angry. Do you know how much it cost Frit and Forta to dig up all those old records for you? He was taken aback. They didn't say anything about the cost, he protested. Of course not. You were their guest. Victor said doggedly, I'm really sorry, Narina, but how was I to know it cost so much money? Nobody ever said anything to me. Said what it cost? Oh, Victor, did you really think that two sensitive, artistic, decent people like Frit and Forta would say anything so vulgar? I'm sorry, he grumbled, and then defensively said, What does it matter? You people are closing your eyes to what's really important. What's happening to the universe? He stopped, surrendering, because he could see that she was obvious that she was looking at him with resigned incomprehension. She said, obviously, trying to be reasonable. Well, Victor, you said yourself all these things were zillions of miles away, and they took millions of years to happen. How can you call them important? He ground his teeth. Knowledge is important, he barked. It was an article of faith. Unfortunately, Narina was not of his religion. She took a turn of two around the room, looking at him in, in bafflement. Victor did not like the feeling that he had committed a terrible social blunder. I could get a job and pay them back, he offered. The kind of job you could get, Victor, she said with a sigh, would not pay them back in twenty years. What can you do? She hesitated and plunged in. Victor? Who are Marie, Claude, Risa, and Mom? What? They are names you used to say when you were feverish from the fever from the freezer burn, she explained. Sometimes you called me Marie and Claude, sometimes Risa. And just at the beginning, I think you said Mom. Were these women you loved? He was flushing. When was my mother? He said gruffly. Marie, Claude, and Risa? Yes. I believed it was that, she sighed, twirling a lock of his hair in her slim fingers. And then she looked at him seriously. Victor, she said. I could design a woman like you if you wished. A woman like you? I think he was supposed to say for you, but he, liter he literally wrote out, I could design a woman like you if you wish. Okay. Maybe she meant physically. <laughs> I could make one from your own genes, as I did with Belit from Fort and Frit. Or if you could describe this Risa and this Marie Claude, I could make one like them. Or with the best qualities of both, if you wish. She would be physically of your kind, not as tall and slim as we are, of course. She added compassionately. It would take time. The embryo must gestate, the child grow twenty years, perhaps, before she would be of mating age. He looked at her with a sudden shock. What are you telling me? he demanded. Do you want to stop our, uh, our... She let him flounder without an ending to the sentence. When it was clear he couldn't find one, she shook her head affectionately. Come to bed, she ordered. It's late. <laughs> he obeyed, of course, and when they had made love and Victor rolled over to get some sleep, it seemed that it was only minutes before Narina was poking at him. It must have been later than he thought, because she was fully dressed, gauzy work robe over her cash sex, hair pinned up out of the way. Get up, Victor, she ordered. He craned his neck to blink at her. What? Why? It wasn't uncommon for Nina, for Nina to, have, to, to have to get up early to work, but she didn't usually insist on his own rising. She looked serious. I want you to go to New Man Home with Pelly, she told him. He gaped at her. New Man Home? I would have suggested that months ago, but hey, I'm just an idiot. It's like, I grew up on New Man Home, I walked around on New Man Home, I still have the muscle density for New Man Home, but hey, let's run around on all these habitats and alien planets cringing and whining and complaining about all the data on New Man Home without ever going there. <laughs> Sorry. He's leaving tomorrow, she said. Victor rubbed his eyes. He was having trouble ma taking in what she was had said. Are you angry because of the money, he asked plaintively. No, yes, but that isn't why. It is simply time for it to be over, that's all. But... But, oh, Victor, she sighed, why are you being so difficult? You didn't think I would pair you with, pair with you permanently, did you? You go bangy bangy, the new leaf. <laughs> One time only. Pelly's ship was, an impressive, was as impressive inside as out. Only a chemical rocket, to be sure, but a huge one. 
Victor was impressed all over again at the richness of a society that could afford to build such vast, sophisticated machines for so little purpose. To Victor's surprise, Frit, Forda, and Belit turned up at the launching. Forda and Frit almost weeping as they kissed their son. It looked exactly like a farewell. Belit, Victor cried. What is it? I'm coming with you, the boy said simply. Incredulous, Victor turned towards his parents and recoiled from the anger in their eyes. Yes, he is going to join you, Victor, Frit said bitterly. He has discussed it all night, but Belit insisted. He is freed now. How can we stop him? But I cannot forgive you, Victor, for putting these ideas in his head. <gasps> Poor Victor! No! You wouldn't keep your damn mouth shut, you whiny little brat! <laughs> <laughs> Every time with him. Chapter 27. It's a very short chapter. It's actually about a page. Actually, it, 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 it's slightly less than a page. It's, it's on face one and then on the other face, but if you look at both, it's literally like a paragraph less than a page. <laughs> So we'll read chapter 27. There are some chapters in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that are literally one sentence. Which is just... Anyway. In the middle of that feebly expiring universe, Wan Tu suddenly felt almost young again. There was still nuclear fusion going on somewhere. Then the last of the ancient memories fell into place, and his next thought was to curse himself. He had been such a fool. Why hadn't he thought already? Why hadn't he planned for this? It would have been so easy for him to do the same trick on any scale he liked and send whole galaxies of stars off in the long-term storage of fast as light travel so that he would have billions upon billions of them ready for his use in any time in, in this time of his need. For that matter, why hadn't he built some sort of homing impulse into the matter Doppler's instructions so that he could have to return to normal space nearby? The list of changes one two could make against himself had suddenly become almost endless. But he gave up on them as common sense reasserted itself. Self-recrimination wasn't really one to style. Anyway, he had more exciting things to think about. Yes, yes, the memories were clear. There were twelve stars, and they were still alive, still even young, and all his. True, they had been somewhat depleted by the drain of energies that had been needed to send them hurtling across the universe, and certainly they were now a terribly long way away, but they were his. He searched eagerly through this, his specific memories of that offhand action. There was not much there, but he was certain that some of them had billions of years yet to go, even on the main sequence. Then they would be long-lived dwarfs from, for much longer than that. Cheerful for the first time in many eons, Wan Tu began the task of planning how to make use of this wholly unexpected new gift. Thanks, past me! <laughs> uh, past me knows how to take a punch. Alright, this chapter is exceptionally long. All right, there are literally like three chapters left, but the time has come. I know why, KB. Why? Well, because it can. Ooh, big stretch, big stretch, big stretch, big stretch. It is so good to stretch. Ah, oh, okay, I have stretched. <laughs> <clears throat> There's a couple of things. First, I do have to do that deal there. All that four. Um. I have to work on that thing for seven to print out her a thing for the thing you sing you see you think thing 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 anyway back to the music <clears throat> anyway so I do have to find a way to print out that thing for seven because that's how KB do um but before we wander off I want to go ahead and let you guys know that if you like what you heard today rather than saw if you like what you heard today please feel free to follow if you haven't followed already if you have followed and would like to see more of what I do, you can follow over on YouTube at youtube.com slash 4 short where you can find over a thousand Let's Play videos for your viewing pleasure. I cannot talk right now. You can also follow on Twitter and or Facebook for news and updates. I was going to swim a because the words talk go do thing. Because I'm smart and I just like cheese whiz and peanuts. Anyway. <laughs> And if you'd like to join us, we do have our Discord channel, of course, where you can join us on our Discord. You can come in, hang out, chat with us if you like. Um, you know, no one to go live, things like that. On top of that... Hmm? Oh, yeah. Now, on top of that, if you'd like to help support the channel, there are many ways of supporting our channel. Shh, give me no yelling. No yelling, sorry. If you'd like to help support our channel, we have a couple of options for supporting our channel, including Patreon, and subbing, and viewing, and following. All good things, so you can do those things. Now, this is not yelling, this is my normal speaking voice. But, anyway, so I want to go ahead and throw some love for you guys. Um, there's a couple of people out there I want to throw some love at. So first, of course, we have 
Dirkus! Dirkus Mars Channel. Dirkus, who is um, currently playing Spin Tire, so you can watch a Russian play a Russian game. How intriguing. On top of that, we also have Red. The Red Pandar. Uh, Red is currently playing Subnautica, so a couple of options for you guys there. There's a couple of other people out there, but none of them are playing anything I care about, so ha! Suck it, nerds. <laughs> Although I will show some love to Sun Guardian, because I haven't seen him on for quite some time, and he needs that love, right? So, I... Yes. Yeah, so, oh, I did spell it right. So, yeah, Sun, Guard, Sun Guardian is also playing that which is uh, Dreadnought. So you guys have some choices there. Now, as for me, I have to run my outro and go. Tomorrow's stream, I'm hoping to do a creative stream. I was working on some art last night before I left work for a new enema. I also have some leftover art that I want to trade up and make into another creature. A creature feature. I'm working on enemies now on the game. And I haven't worked on the game since last week because I've been, like, super mega busy. So I'm going to be working on some enemas. So we're going to try to do a slime. It's going to require some ray casting and some really interesting stuff. Um, other than that, we'll have to see how it rolls. You know what I mean? So, because that, the, the one, the slime I'm going to be working on is going to be difficult because it's going to have to do, do collision stuff and all sorts of other jazz. So, we'll have to figure that one out. As for El Moi, I am going to meander and run my outro and go. Today's music again brought to you by them internets because I know you guys like them internets. You can check the, out them internets here, of course. And again, because I told Seven I would do my best, if you guys want to help out her friend with his GoFundMe campaign, you guys can go ahead and check that out and help him out. Again, not a requirement, but if you would like to help in other ways, um, retweet it out, tell your friends, tell your family, put it on your Facebook, smash it out there, make it go viral. Do something good for the world. Make it go viral. Give, give someone the virus of love. <laughs> you gotta give someone an SDD. Hi, Lils. Wanna say hi to everybody? Right there in the oh. microphone. That's very kind of you. Sketch, 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 sketch. Sketch, 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 sketch. Yeah, sketch your cheek. Ooh, happy cut. Happy, happy, happy cut. You say hi? That's my thumb. Alright, here you go. It'll be yelly. There. Have a good night, KB. I will do my best. It's Saturday. It's going to be slow-ish. Problem is, is they keep taking people off the weekends, and so it should be slow, but it's not. Throw those rays around, because nobody likes Ray. Damn it, Ray! <sighs> anyway, so yeah, I'm going to wander. I'm going to hit the uh, kill the music. I'm going to do my outro, and then we're going to roll. So you guys have yourselves a safe day, and I hope to see you tomorrow for more Streamy Deemy. If not, then I'll see you when I see you.